Welcome, everyone, to the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, coming to you from Cemetery Hill here in Gettysburg, live at the Battle of Gettysburg podcast studios here at Getty's Gear. I am your co-host, historian and licensed guide, Eric Lindblade, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, historian and licensed guide, Jim Hessler. Jim, what do we have on tap to start off Season 4 with? Well, hello, Eric, and hello, everybody. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 1, and we're going to be doing Long Street Part 3. We're going to conclude the heartbreaking trilogy of James Longstreet that we began in Season 3 with Long Street Part 1 and Part 2. I think we're going to start off tonight, Eric, right at the beginning of July 2nd. Jim, do you want to just catch the listeners up real quick to kind of what Longstreet has been doing on the battlefield in the previous day. Yeah, sure. So I think where we left off last time, it was the evening of July 1st. Lee was considering his options for the second day. Longstreet, as we know, or at least as the historical record tells us, Longstreet was extremely concerned by the idea that Lee was uh, going to commit the army here at Gettysburg. And that, you know, he, Longstreet goes back to his camp out towards Marsh Creek, out towards Cashtown uh, that evening, according to Arthur Fremantle. While many of the Confederates were celebrating the day's activities, Longstreet himself was very sober. And according to Fremantle, Longstreet, you know, realized the Confederates were going to have a hard job ahead of him on July 2nd. Lee, meanwhile, continued to discuss his options into the evening. Those over and visits Richard Ewell again, considers pulling Ewell's corps around from the Confederate left. Ewell talks Lee into leaving his corps in position, but as we know, Ewell ultimately is not able to capture Culp's Hill or do anything of value that evening. So really, as the sun rises on the morning of July 2nd, 1863, Lee is considering what he's going to do, but I think he's really more and more focusing towards an attack against the Union left, which is really going to coalesce as we move into the morning. When we do tours and other talks, we do kind of simplify the events from the morning of, or really the evening of July 1st into the morning of July 2nd, that we think from the moment Yule doesn't push on Cemetery Hill, Lee has said, well, I'm going to attack the next day. I think, as you said, Lee is starting to move yeah. in that direction. The question is going to be is where does this attack actually take place? Well, well you know, and, to and that, how are we going to conduct it? Yeah, and you know, to that point, the so-called sunrise attack order. And, you know, I typically don't go into great deal on the sunrise attack yeah. order because I really feel like it has been long discredited by any credible historian. But the idea being Pendleton, Early, and some of Longstreet's post-war critics later came back and said Lee expected an attack to be made at sunrise by Longstreet. And, you know, by not doing it, Longstreet then was conceivably uh, derelict in his duty. Sunrise attack order, as we said, has pretty much been discredited. It didn't happen, but it gives people the impression, to your point about simplification, it gives people the impression that Lee already knows what's going to happen early on the morning of July 2nd, and that simply isn't the case. You know, I've thought about every tour I've ever done. I've never had someone say, well, what about it's, this sunrise yeah, attack exactly. order? I've never had that. No. That Jubal Early, man, he was smart. Yeah, I don't get that I'll either. say this. If yeah. you're still in the market of trying to save Longstreet from the sunrise attack order, man, that, that battle's been fought 30 years ago. <laughs> you're good. You've won. Uh, but I think is it possible that over the course, at some point on the first, in the late afternoon or the evening, or even you know, as we move in, does Lee say to somebody, if we could, yeah. I would like to attack at sunrise? There's a difference between saying, I would like to do something and say, this was the plan that we actually had. I think the other thing, too, with the sunrise attack order that can morph into a legitimate conversation is the idea of, okay... Lee is not ready at sunrise. No way Lee is going to realistically expect Longstreet to attack at sunrise. But knowing now that Longstreet's attack is going to begin at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it is legitimate to ask, did Lee expect that attack to occur earlier than 4 p.m.? And, you know, as part of what we're going to do on this very special episode of Longstreet's Counter March, we're going to talk about all the planning and the strategizing and the movements that ultimately did push that attack until 4 o'clock. 
certainly in Lee's mind, he would rather attack sooner than later. I think every moment he delays, he understands the Army of the Potomac is only going to get stronger. Yep, more time to concentrate. And and I think he looks back at some of his past successes that in order to follow this up, he really needs, well, a good example of the Chancellorsville model. Mm-hmm. You have fighting's flaring up very early on, on May 3rd. After this, you're, we're not waiting. And we also look at, you know, so much of it's been made that Longstreet didn't attack, but Richard Anderson wasn't in position by the morning of July 2nd. Mm-hmm. You, know, you still have units being moved in and around that the Army of Northern Virginia is not ready to launch an attack if unless they were doing it against maybe Cemetery Hill or Culp's Hill. That's the only area where they would be theoretically prepared to launch an attack. Yeah, so no sunrise attack order. Sunrise attack order, bad. Didn't happen. Well, let's uh, let's kind of get the morning activities going. You know, generally speaking, somewhere between 4 o'clock a.m. and 4.15 a.m. And again, you'll see times vary. But somewhere in that neighborhood, Captain Samuel Johnston is going to depart with Lee's orders on his famous, or shall I say infamous, reconnaissance against the Union left. Now, Captain Johnston, he was uh, 30 years old. He had been a captain of engineers on Lee's staff since August of 1862. Uh, He had also done some work with Stewart and Longstreet before that. Johnston had assisted Longstreet at 2nd Manassas, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. And I bring that up because, again, this isn't going to be one of those, oh, hi, I'm Captain Johnston, pleased to meet you. You know, these guys, they have a track record, they've worked together, and frankly, they have done so successfully. And how many times have we seen Samuel Johnston kind of appear almost out of nowhere? All of a sudden, he's here at Gettysburg, (laughs) this unknown guy. You know, Lee has never worked with him. And and what I often tell groups that we discuss this part of the battle is that I think Robert E. Lee sees a lot of himself in Captain Johnston. Because what was Robert E. Lee 30 years before? Yeah. This young, daring engineer that's willing to do these reconnaissances and do these things that he needs to do. So, And Lee trusts him. So much of Lee's decision-making is based on using people he trusts. Mm-hmm. And I can guarantee you, Lee is not sending him out there unless he feels he is able to do the job. Yeah, and and I think we had a listener question, too, if I remember correctly, about, uh, well, what's going on with Major Clark and, and some of these other guys? So we'll throw in the caveat, yes, there are other reconnaissances done that morning. Yes, there are other guys accompanying Captain Johnston. But for the most part, Johnston is really the only one who primarily writes about it. And this is one of the reasons why we always focus on what Johnston says and what Johnston says he did. And I think people look at it and they assume in the 19th century reconnaissance is somebody rides out, looks around, I've got the information, I ride back. What we usually see is a constant monitoring and, and not to go off into this rabbit hole. But this is an area where had Jeb Stewart been here, mm-hmm. his troopers would have provided that constant, almost around the clock noting of what's happening, what's changing, what's going on. Well, it's not just we see it at one point and then we're kind of in the dark until we go. Yeah, and so that that concept of constant monitoring or not constant monitoring is going to come back to haunt these guys uh, later in the afternoon. Now, according to Johnston, his orders were, quote, to reconnoiter along the enemy's left and return as soon as possible, end quote. According to Johnston, Lee said nothing about finding a route over which troops would need to be moved unobserved by the enemy, but, quote, it was not necessary as that was part of my duty as a reconnoitering officer and would be attended to without special instructions. Indeed, he said nothing about the movement of troops at all and left me only with the knowledge of what he wanted, which I had obtained after long service with him. So right there in that statement from Johnson, it tells us what his orders are. It frankly tells him what doesn't need to be said because, you know, he knows what the duty of a reconnaissance officer is. And last but not least, Johnston is touching upon the long service he has had with General Lee that really by this point, he knows what Lee expects. And I mean, imagine you do this reconnaissance and you get to General Lee and do you know the disposition of the enemy? Yes, sir, I do. Well, how can we get to it? 
oh, I forgot to figure that out. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. well, in- that's, and I think so much of the Civil War, things are not written down that are expected because it's just part of the job. Nobody needs to outline you, how do you do it? And and Lee, knowing him, knew that he was going to do this. Well, and that's why today, you know, as historians, we're stuck looking at what's in the ORs or looking at this. And we all know there's a boatload of verbal communications, courier traffic, whatever, you know, that's unfortunately been been lost to history. So, so Johnston takes off with a, in the company of a few other individuals headed towards a position opposite the Union left. Now, th- folks, we should probably caveat here. This is not the Johnston's reconnaissance episode. We're not going to get deep into the weeds on Johnston's recon. We're really focusing today on Johnston's role as it relates to Longstreet's countermarch, just to kind of clear that up. So if somebody says, yeah, well, didn't Johnston go this way or that way? At, at time out. That's going to be an episode for a different time. And you know, this is something over time I have come to kind of the feeling I'm not really concerned where Johnston went necessarily in the grand scheme of things it doesn't matter so much as to what he reported to robert e lee you know i wrote those words in sickles at gettysburg 11 years ago and i don't remember if i came up with that myself or if i nicked that from someone but i swear to god i have heard a hundred people use that quote on me like over the last year especially ever since that recent article mm-hmm. came out in gettysburg magazine yeah if for, for intents and purposes today what did johnston tell lee or what did he not tell lee yeah i mean it whether he gets to Little Round Top or he gets to Big Round Top or he gets to Bushman's Hill or none of the above, yeah. that ultimately doesn't matter. I think we get so fixated as Gettysburg students on where this piece right. was that we forget what where he got doesn't matter. Yeah. It's the information he gleans that gives to Robert E. Lee that now, matters. That's the important part. Yeah, now the route that Johnson describes is relevant for today's conversation only in terms of the subsequent countermarch kind of describes a route that sounds like he goes over Willoughby Run, crosses near Pitzer's schoolhouse to Warfield Ridge. Again, you know, the mystery kind of deepens after that, yada, yada. But it's 4, four o'clock, 4.15, Johnston is gone. He's on his way. Longstreet said the stars were still shining brightly when he reported to Lee's headquarters. So again, give or take, he's arriving at headquarters at about the same time. And I think it's interesting you noted the time. 4, 4.15 in the morning. 12 hours later, this attack finally begins. Yeah, so Longstreet's at headquarters. Other things are going on. Again, about 5 a.m., uh, Artillery Chief General Pendleton says he makes a survey from the Confederate right, probably at about the same time, or at least between 5 and, say, 7 a.m. Hood's division is going to start to arrive on the Chambersburg Pike. Probably they're going to park in and around Hare Ridge. Claus's division is going to come in after them. So now it's it's probably a little bit after 7 a.m. And we'll focus a little bit on McClaws, because McClaws mm-hmm. plays a role in the countermarch. Uh, but McClaws, again, comes to headquarters, Lee's headquarters, and obviously he finds the generals in consultation. And many of us know the story. There's a map out there, and as the story allegedly goes, Lee is going to attempt to place McClaws' division on this map south of the Peach Orchard. Uh, Longstreet then allegedly points to the map and says, no, I want your division placed so, and is going to kind of run his finger in a direction parallel to the Emmitsburg Road, you know, or sort of opposite where Lee had placed them. Lee is going to reply, no, General, I wish it placed just perpendicular to that or just the opposite. A couple things going on here in my mind. There's been some debate recently about, well, would this conversation have occurred before or after Johnston came back? I think it certainly could have, as the historiography typically has been, it could have occurred before Johnston came back. They have a county map. The county map says the Peach Orchard is there. Uh, They've sent Johnston in that direction. So I'm not overly concerned about the timing of this. But obviously, you know, you do have at least this example here of early on Longstreet and Lee possibly being at cross purposes. I'm not going to make too much out of that, again, as we established in 
part one and part two, Lee and Longstreet have this relationship where, you know, Longstreet is free to sort of voice his contrary opinions, and Lee is frankly free to take or not take Longstreet's suggestions. So a lot of people kind of, you know, you know, Moxley Sorrell does say that during the course of the day, Longstreet failed to conceal some anger. McClaws says Longstreet appeared irritated, but I did not ask why. I'm not going to read a ton into that yet. And this idea of Longstreet's aggravated, he's annoyed. Just speaking for myself, when I don't get any rest, I don't get any sleep, <laughs> yeah. I'm aggravated and annoyed. Uh, that doesn't make my thinking go better. And I think, too, the idea that I think some of Lee's thinking, the evidence is there Lee is thinking an attack somewhere to the south. Where exactly that attack is going to be is going to be based on the information he yeah. gets. But I don't think it's a stretch for Lee to start planning for that. And worst case, Captain Johnson comes back and says, sir, it's not feasible. Yeah, right. Here's another example of the right. morning of July 2nd. Right. General Meade wants to attack from Culp's Hill right. against the Confederacy. He sends Slocum and Warren out there. What they ultimately tell him is, sir, it can't be done. Yeah. There's no reason Lee would be doing this. I don't, I don't see Lee just say, well, I'm not going to make any plans until I get this information. Yeah, that, that he, just is counterproductive. You're right. And the other thing, too, is McClaw, Lee, at this point, is not prescribing to McClaws, how are you going to get there? He's just kind of saying, I'm going to want you here. McClaws actually offers a couple of times to basically leave and reconnoiter, and both Longstreet, in particular Longstreet and Lee, but Longstreet in particular basically says, no, I don't want you leaving your command, don't reconnoiter. So, yeah, you know, the other piece of this is what does Lee want McClaws to do, and how is McClaws going to get there? Clearly hasn't been prescribed yet. Okay, so somewhere then in that area, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, Johnston returns. Quote, after the usual delays, he finds headquarters. And upon return to headquarters, Johnston says he traces his route. Now we're getting into the how do you get there part. Johnston traces his route on a map for Lee. And, you know, again, did he or didn't he get the little round top like he said earlier? We're going to, you know, we're going to do this later on. And I think that's an interesting point, you know, when Lee, the, the famous point, Lee says, did you get there? Yep. You know, and, and I think there's a difference between if you say, did you get there, and you're standing on Seminary Ridge, pointing to that area, or if you're looking at a map. Yeah. And I've often, I think that's what sometimes gets lost in that, is we have to think about the context of what Lee and Johnson are looking at. Depending on where you have that conversation, it can be interpreted a couple different ways, I think. Yeah, I mean, at least from Johnson's perspective. He said later, you know, they're pointing at the little round top on the map. Did you get there? And Johnston assured him that he did. But Lee's questions to Johnston, I think, are really focusing on determining if an approach route is open. And not just on what Johnston saw. Again, the recon is based on, okay, where was the Union left? You know, and as, as we've said a couple of times, you know, John, wherever Johnston sort of gives these guys the idea the left flank is, that's going to be short of where it will be at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Doesn't mean Johnston's reconnaissance is wrong at 8 o'clock in the morning. It just means that it's going to be outdated at 4 o'clock. But I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves on that. Right. But here's now where we kind of get more into the countermarch aspect of it. So you're questioning Johnston on whether or not this approach route is open, right? How are you going to get, how did you get there? Kind of thing. According to Johnston, Lee then wanted me to join Longstreet and no other instructions were given to me. I'm not sure, but I think it may have been 9 a.m. when I joined Longstreet. We did not move off very promptly, nor was our march at all rapid. It did not strike me that General Longstreet was in a hurry to get into position. It might have been that he thought hurry was unnecessary. Okay, so wait a minute. You're the, re you're the reconnaissance officer of the morning. You just went through this whole thing, tracing it out on a map with Lee. Lee says, did you get there? Yeah, I got there, kind of thing. Okay, go with General Longstreet, and according to Johnston, you know, no other instructions were given me. Again, on paper, that statement by itself is not too innocuous, but again, when we get into the afternoon here and we get into the countermarch and we find Johnston making some other similar claims, I'm not buying it. And I've seen some people try to explain that Johnston doesn't speak up as much because yeah. he's a junior officer, he's a staff officer. I don't know how much I buy that. You right. know, if this is an unknown officer that gets plucked from the ranks and do this, I can understand being intimidated by Lee and McClaws and Longstreet and those guys. But 
Johnson's been doing this for a year. Yeah. He knows these guys. Right. And also, right. a staff officer is, at times, kind of allowed to speak truth to power a little bit. Yeah. That's their job. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it, it's very strange to me, this idea that Johnson's is kind of passive, afraid to right. speak up. I just don't buy that. I yeah. think. Um, the other thing, too, though, when people think countermarch, they almost disproportionately think too much about Porter Alexander. Right. The number one question I get on my countermarch programs is, well, why didn't they follow Alexander and stuff like that? So we should probably bring Alexander into it because at about 8 a.m., he was ordered to report to Longstreet. And he says, basically, take command of his own battalion, uh, Henry and Cabell's, which are attached to Hood and McClaws' division, and also reconnoiter the left flank, the enemy left flank. Quote, I was told that we were to attack the enemy's left and was directed to take command of my own battalion, etc., etc., and to reconnoiter the ground and cooperate with the infantry in the attack. I was especially cautioned in moving up the guns to avoid exposing them to the view of a signal station of the enemies on the Round Top Mountain. I'll add two before I pause. I don't remember seeing or hearing anything of Longstreet's infantry, nor did I get the impression that General Lee thought there was any unnecessary delay going on. You know, a little more than that I'll add from Johnston. Uh, he says he just arrived. He knew nothing of the situation. His instructions were to reconnoiter the flank to be attacked, choose my own positions and means of reaching them. He'll later say this duty occupied, according me to the best of my recollection, about one or two hours. And then later, en route, at one point, the direct road leading to this place came in sight of the enemy's signal station, but I turned out of the road before reaching the exposed part, passed through some open meadows a few hundred yards, regained the road without coming in sight. Eric, I think we're going to need to come back to that later. I think that's an important point. Yeah, maybe there. check bookmark that. Yeah, for, save that for, for later, reference. folks. It might matter. And, and I think what we assume when we look at, at the countermarch is also the idea that if they're sighted by the little round top signal station, that the little round top signal station would be able to interpret with 100% accuracy what the heck the Confederates are doing. And I think what's kind of interesting is you can read the dispatches from that signal station. You know what time they're seeing things and when they're saying this. And what they're saying is, you know, even if you do see a movement there, okay, is it a movement to try to get around our flank? Or is maybe Lee doing this as a diversion to move his army out to another position? What's he trying to do? Is Lee retreating from Gettysburg? If you're watching it from Little Round Top, there's any number of ways that could present as something. Mm -hmm. Sure. What sure. they're just saying is, you know, the idea is it's half. I think the idea is that if they get sighted, that somehow the Union Army is going to figure out exactly what they're doing. It depends on how that intelligence is interpreted. But clearly, Lee... Longstreet, Alexander, everybody involved would much rather have the element of surprise than not have the element of surprise. Exactly right, which is what I always say on my programs, right? The number one thing you're looking for in this flank attack is the element of surprise. And the, to whatever extent we can maintain that by any element of secrecy possible is obviously what they're telling Alexander to stick to. And as we'll see again, they're going to tell McClaws and the infantry to, uh, to adhere to as well. And it would not have shocked me if Robert E. Lee did not push for the importance of secrecy in this. The first element you need for a successful attack is really the element of surprise. If you have that element, the odds are in your favor in a lot of cases. And we see that time and time again in the Civil War where this attack seemingly comes out of nowhere and is pretty successful. So for Lee to have success in the flank, he's got to have that element of surprise. There's just no other way around it. The other thing that I was just going to kind of mention as well, just as a caveat here, related to Alexander, there's no guarantee that Alexander and then Longstreet's infantry later, there's no guarantee that they follow the same route exactly. And I'm throwing that out as a caveat because, you know, there's people out there who think Alexander just takes a different route altogether. And I don't want to spoil their theories, you know, or anything like that on the air. But the point being, there's no guarantee that these guys are all following the same trail. And in fact, you can probably make a case that they're not. Remember, folks, Porter Alexander writes a lot of stuff. 
He's got an account of this in the Southern Historical Society papers. He follows that up in Battles and Leaders of the Civil War. Then he follows that up in Military Memoirs. He follows that up with Fighting for the Confederacy. Oh, yeah, and I forgot his own official report that was filed, you know, within a couple of weeks after the battle. All of those are slightly different. I tend to like the Southern Historical Society version because it's the earliest, you know, besides his report. And frankly, his report doesn't tell us much of anything, but I tend to like that one. But you've got to remember, depending on which Porter Alexander book is sitting on your bookshelf at home, all of his accounts of this are slightly different, folks, and that does make a difference. So what you're saying is the historiography of an event matters? Is that what you're is that what you're trying to say here that we have to look at what they say and when rather than just assume? Yeah. Wow. Damn. Wow. I think I think we're I think we're going I think we're going there with this. Uh but I do think all joking aside, most people have Alexander's fighting for the Confederacy on their bookshelves. That's the most commercially available of his accounts, and that's the one most people have on their shelves. That one is written last. Mm -hmm. And again, I know everybody says, oh, that one was written for his family. That's going to be the most honest and accurate. Eh, I'm not so sure that I agree with that. But whether I agree with that or not, fighting for the Confederacy is written last. He's got stuff that he writes much earlier than that that, frankly, is, I think, equally as, if, equally as plausible, if not more so, than what he does in Fighting for the Confederacy. And in this one, he says he basically moved around to the right, regained the road, took an hour or two, ultimately ended up with his b battalion down by Willoughby Run in the Pitzer Schoolhouse. And at times, people have noted that I am sometimes... A little harsh on John Gordon's memoirs. Yeah, I always say take them with a grain of salt and everything else. I thought you were actually quite supportive well, of Gordon when well, he did the Barlow's Knoll thing. A little bit, but in terms of, you know, a lot of other things he did, you gotta take them with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Most people will consider maybe the finest memoir ever written by a Confederate officer is Alexander's. Maybe. It is a, I mean, at times it has been referred to that by other historians that this is maybe the finest yes, view yes. inside of it. The, and yeah, it's a great memoir, but that doesn't mean that it is without fault. And I think that's where over time, if students are told this is the absolute best source, it is unquestioned. People don't question it. So they just take it at face value. And that's, I, I hate, I don't want to sound like almost like a conspiracy nut here, but when it comes to this battle, question everything. Question every account. Make sure it works. Make sure it fits. Did they write anything else? Had this been the only thing that Alexander writes, I think you'd take it with different weight mm -hmm. than if you have really this mountain, mountain of, stuff. Of, of stuff he writes. Yeah, an onslaught of Alexander. Ooh, could that be the season seven thing? But yeah, you have to take all of it into consideration, and too often we don't do that. And I think yeah, it's something we I really think, should. And I think too often... People take Alexander, and again, I'm harping on fighting for the Confederacy particularly. Too often people take Alexander as basically gospel. Yes. Yeah. Alexander said it, so... And I get it, he writes very well, mm -hmm. he's easy to read. I refer to him often, as most historians do, when I need a pithy artillery quote or something like that. But I'm telling you folks, look at all of his accounts and you will see variants. And I think that's something that people have probably seen from our show over time, is that we really do break down these accounts probably more than, than probably anybody else. And I think we think a lot about them because there's a tendency to think just because a participant writes it, that it's right. Mm -hmm. And I, I even had an engagement on social media last week, not about this event, but, you know, the, the idea of, well, this is what was written. Your take, what you're saying as a historian is that their words don't matter or that if they were there, you weren't. Well, no, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, I'm saying that's their interpretation, but it doesn't fit the general picture yeah. because these accounts have to fit into the environment in which they happen. If you are saying that I did this at seven, but the attack doesn't go, but the attack is at five, we've got a problem here. We've got to find a way to make that fit. Yeah, I think I think because you know a lot of people do the opposite too. They don't read anything the participants say, but they walk the ground. 
Well, I know the ground. I've been over that hill a hundred times in my life, you know, kind of thing. But then they don't read what the participants say. And frankly, sometimes they're too dismissive of the participants. I think an advantage we have in our occupation is obviously the ability to both access the historical record and to whatever extent we can get familiar with the terrain involved. And I think, folks, that's what you got to do is you got to find the right way to marry your understanding of the terrain with the historical record. And I think too many people do one or the other. And I would argue when you do this, take some of these accounts onto the field and try Mm -hmm. to put yourself as close to where these individuals were, because depending on what you're looking at and where, Features here at Gettysburg look a lot different, and so we can't just assume that when you read this account and you're envisioning yourself standing by the North Carolina Monument or the Virginia Monument, you know, looking at this, no, you, you've got to think about, okay, where was Alexander during this time? Well, the other thing, too, I mean, related to that is, you know, I, I've for years I've given countermarch tours because, it's like I've said, it's kind of a little mini topic that I enjoy doing. So much of it action and the movements that we're talking about today are not occurring on National Park Service property. They are occurring behind the lines. I always tell people, you know, that area, you know, we're we're trained to think of the battle as Seminary Ridge versus Cemetery Ridge. That area west of Seminary Ridge is a Confederate superhighway for a couple of days, going all the way out to the Black Horse Tavern and beyond. And especially with a lot of that being on private property, that you know, then and now, obviously a lot of it does look significantly different than it did in 1863. People have carved up her ridge with all these modern mm-hmm. homes. Drives me crazy. All these history enthusiasts come to Gettysburg because they love history and they love the quaint character of Adams County. And then they go carve up her ridge with their luxury custom built home. It drives me crazy, people. Wait a minute. Are you saying the biggest house on the biggest side of town (laughs) on the biggest hill? Uh, I'm having a hard time holding these alligators down. That's right. You know, if Flair wants to come to Gettysburg and build the biggest house on the biggest hill on her ridge, he can. But, you know, if you're moving from New Jersey or Connecticut or something like that, can't you find somewhere else to put the house? Unless you're a 16-time world champion. (laughs) No. All right, so uh, we should probably move on here. So kind of summarize, now we're about 9 o'clock or so. Uh, Lee is more or less going to leave Longstreet to consult with Ewell. And again, the general plan for the attack on the Union left, or at least the the basic idea behind it, seems to have come together by this Mm -hmm. point. Uh, We've done this on prior shows. We did it on the Peach Orchard, but it's our own kind of self-contained episode here. Just as a reminder, I think what Lee is basically telling Longstreet Street is, you know, we want to gain a position. We want to gain that position along the Emmitsburg Road, the area around the Peach Orchard. We want to gain it from which then we can use our artillery to be brought to bear with effect against the further attack on the ridge beyond it, uh, to Cemetery Ridge and Cemetery Hill. So, you know, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Nowhere in Lee's order to Long Street does it say attack up the Emmitsburg Road. What it does say is gain the Emmitsburg Road, and that's important to today's conversation because, again, if we are trying to get Longstreet's infantry to a position near the Peach Orchard, the reason being we want to gain that ground, both for infantry and for Alexander's artillery as well. But that's the basic plan. If you want more details on that, you should go to our Season 1 multi-part Peach Orchard episodes or if you want to do that even better yet buy jim and brit's book oh, on thank this you. i mean if you want to delve into this and and i think this is something where we look at the importance of the peach orchard so much of this attack is going to be depending on what's the condition of the confederate control of the emmitsburg road where do they control the road at that matters but i think on paper if you look at not so much how this attack ended up but what is intended? Mm-hmm. Those are two different things. Yeah, I think right. over time, what happened has morphed into what was intended exactly. to happen. And it's hard to separate the two. And for me, if I'm Robert E. Lee, I want the Peach Orchard yeah. as a position. It's a wonderful artillery platform to support attacks. It also allows me to mass forces along the Emmitsburg Road to attack, to not it. launching from Seminary Ridge. Right. That's right. that's about a half a mile. That matters. 
And so it has a lot of, of advantages. So certainly Lee wants the Peach Orchard. He wants the Emmitsburg Road to support those attacks against Cemetery Ridge. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, the idea is that if we can basically hop from the Emmitsburg Road Ridge, for lack of a better term, to Cemetery Ridge. Well, once we're on Cemetery Ridge and we've got a foothold, well, now we're going to go up towards Cemetery Hill. Yeah. And frankly, Cemetery Hill is a lot easier to attack from Cemetery Ridge. Right. Than it is anywhere else. Right. And as we've talked, and again, we've talked about this in prior installments too. Plus, if you put your artillery in the Peach Orchard area along the Emmitsburg Road, it's a lot easier to converge Confederate artillery fire towards Cemetery Ridge, towards Cemetery Hill, than it is from Seminary Ridge. In fact, if you were still on Seminary Ridge, it would be bloody well impossible to do that. And this is a little inside baseball here, but usually when I do an overview tour, my stop to talk about the quote-unquote Pickett's Charge is actually in Ziegler's Grove. Yeah. And a lot of guys have said, why do you stop there? Why don't you go to the angle? I think you see more from Ziegler's Grove than you do at the angle. And also what I love is if you're standing kind of by uh, the Wilson Memorial there, mm-hmm. and if you look between the two buildings of the Bryan, yeah, yeah. and you look right down to the south, guess what you see right there? It's right lined it's up. It's right there. You see the peach orchard. When you have people standing there and you say, okay, artillery there, mm-hmm. artillery to your west, there's artillery to your north, well, man, that looks a lot more impressive than just standing on Seminary Ridge by the North Carolina Memorial exactly. and say, well, gee, what's this artillery really going to do? Right. And so I think it's a matter of, and I would urge everybody, try to go out and look at the battlefield from different perspectives, from different positions, and see what you can see. Don't just get stuck and standing in one area, because where you are matters. And and I think we see that in this planning of July 2nd. We're going to see certain pieces that Lee needs for his plan he is not going to gain Mm -hmm. at the time he needs them. And it's going to ultimately alter the plan, as we're going to see significantly. Now, Longstreet said that he didn't receive his orders to attack until about 11 a.m. So, again, going back to our earlier conversation about what a bloody long day this is, you know, we're already seven hours into the day. Um, Again, you know, you can kind of debate, is 11 a.m. right? Did he know earlier or that? But he said it was about 11 a.m. But what people do tend to agree on is that he's going to intentionally delay moving until around noon. And he, he gets permission to do that. So if you got issues with that, you know, you can pin it on General Lee as well. But he's going to basically delay movement until after 12 o'clock to await the arrival of a Vander Laws Brigade, which is still on the march towards Gettysburg. Now, you know, what I always say when I look at this you know, the ensuing outcome does basically validate Longstreet's fear that his force is too too weak to venture to make an attack. You know, kind of the famous quote, I don't want to attack with one boot off kind of thing. Uh, but I do find it ironic, too, that they wait for Law's Brigade to come up. And then ultimately, when the attack starts at four o'clock, Law's Brigade is going to be the first one to go in, you know, which is kind of crazy in of itself. And we often think of with this attack, okay, I don't want to go in with one boot off, i.e. picket. Well, it's not like there's another division that's going to be off to the flank of Longstreet that's going to make up for that number. And I think what we forget, too, with this plan is I think the importance of coordination between the Confederate First Corps and the Confederate Third Corps. And I do not think it's just by happenstance that Richard Anderson is the division that is kind of the bridge between the two. Because before the reorganization, who did Anderson serve under? Yeah. He yeah. served under Longstreet. Yeah. They know each other. The staffs know each other. That's a smart move, but you also you got to get you, you have to get Richard Anderson in position. Mm-hmm. You can't. He's just not. You don't snap your fingers. And as we're going to see, the reconnaissance in Pitcher's Woods happens. Who do they run into? They don't run into Longstreet. Right. They run into they run Anderson. And so, you know, you and I have talked about this many times over the years, over a cocktail or whatever. You know, A.P. Hill gets free pass at Gettysburg. Everything, and, you know, we're doing it today, but everything is Longstreet, Longstreet, Longstreet. Uh, and Ewell. And, you know, I think we've done a good job highlighting Ewell on the show. But A.P. Hill in the role of the Third Corps doesn't get the play that it should. But maybe we sort of table some of this for when we do the management of the second day attack episode. And just going back to your point, you know, you look at, of people in history that get blamed for the Confederate defeat here at Gettysburg. 
let's just look at it if we assume it's just a core level. And I'm mm-hmm. going to count Jeb Stewart as a core commander mm-hmm. here. Yes, I know he commands a division, but I think in hierarchy and the way he was viewed, it's it's there. He's not a lieutenant general, but but nonetheless, Stewart gets blamed for losing this yep. battle. Yeah, Longstreet gets blamed for losing this battle. Richard Ewell gets blamed for losing this battle. Some will blame Robert E. Lee for losing this battle. I've never really seen anybody ever blame A.P. Hill for losing Gettysburg. Yeah, I, know, I know. And it's this, that's that one question that we'll sometimes get on tours. Well, where was Hill? What was Hill doing? And usually at this point, I just kind of turn to him and just shrug my shoulders and say, your guess is as good as yeah, mine. Yeah. You know, we just don't have a lot to work on with Hill. Yeah, I mean, whether whether we don't know where Hill is individually, we do know what his troops are doing and, you know, sort of a lot of the issues that they have. But um, so back to the counter march, you know, Longstreet says again, it's about 12 o'clock. He's awaiting the arrival. In his report, Longstreet says, as soon after Law's arrival, as we could make our preparations, the movement began. Now, the brigade in the lead on Longstreet's march is going to be Brigadier General Joseph Kershaw, who we all know is going to attack in and around the wheat field and the Stony Hill area. You know, if I haven't said this already, when you look at the countermarch accounts themselves, there's only a handful of individuals who really write anything substantial about it. Longstreet, Johnston, McClaws, Kershaw being mm-hmm. one of them. And the reason, folks, for that is he is the brigade in, his lead, in the lead. Kershaw says in his report that we were halted until about noon. We were then directed to move under the cover of the hills towards our right. McClaws in 1879 wrote that it was about 1 p.m. Uh, Henry Cabell, McClaws' artillery chief, said it was about 1 or 2 o'clock. Shepard of the 2nd Georgia and Benning's Brigade said it was about 1 p.m. So, you know, you kind of got this 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, split the difference. Obviously, Kershaw's in the lead. He's going to have the earlier time. A guy with Benning in Hood's division is going to have a later time. So, you know, probably the probably the head of it, you know, gets started 12.15-ish, 12.30-ish. Notice how I'm emphasizing-ish yeah. you know, as I say my times here. And- it frustrates me so much when doing programs or other things. People say, okay, well, what time did this happen? Well, it's around this. Well, no, what time? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I wasn't there looking at my cell phone. And neither were they. Yeah, you know what I mean? It depends on when did you wind your watch last. And I think we are a society today so driven by time. Right. Precise right? measurements. Yeah, 19th century time is not that. It looks around 12 because I see where the sun right. is in the air. It's, it's around noon. It's about midday. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. that's all you need to know. So I think we have to... For all the talk about, oh, well, they were just like us. No, they're really not. <laughs> they, they do view the world differently from us at times. I think time is one of those things yeah. that, for us, we give detailed specific times, whereas they would say midday, early morning, yeah. late evening, you know, any more generic catch-all terms that everybody would know what they meant by that. Yeah. Now, if anybody's listening and going, okay, then why should I care about any of this, you know, if you sort of pick a rough start time, and I'm going to go 12.15 to 12.30, and most historians generally agree that the attack begins about 4 o'clock. That doesn't mean that's when Longstreet is going to arrive on Seminary Ridge, but the attack is going to begin about 4 o'clock. So you're kind of operating in this, so I don't know, what does that come out to? Three? Three and a half hour window, right? So you're kind of operating in this three and a half hour window that can help you kind of frame how long does it take. And if you want to play battlefield detective here, use that time frame in conjunction with some movements on the Union side, then you can kind of sort of, again, play armchair general and figure, okay, what might Longstreet have hit if he reached the Union line at 2.30 or 3.30, etc.? And what we're saying is not disregard the times. We're not saying that, that doesn't matter. But the what, precise. What, what we're saying is use the times as a means to kind of organize the activities. That, okay, well, if this is happening around 4 o'clock, what else is happening around 4 o'clock? But also being aware that what happens at 4 o'clock often depends on where you are in line of march, mm-hmm. where yeah. you are on the field, any number of things. I think this is where you, know, you mentioned Kershaw. He's often a figure that people don't bring up a lot mm-hmm. in the countermarch talk. You'll hear McClaws, you'll yeah. hear Longstreet, you'll yeah. hear Alexander, but 
Kershaw's a voice that I think really matters on oh, this that time. has not been looked at enough. And I would argue, too, there probably has not been enough delving into even regimental letters and diaries of looking at what are these guys in the ranks seeing, because you can really glean a lot from that if you take the time to dig. Well, if Kershaw hasn't been looked at enough in terms of the countermarch, we're changing that today, because we're going to look at Kershaw. So, as we said, he leads the, his brigade leads the column. Now, again, like a lot of things, Kershaw's precise starting point is uncertain, but, you know, he, he probably began on or near her ridge, and his post-war battles and leaders account said that he spent the morning about 500 yards from the Black Horse Tavern waiting to begin the march. So if that's accurate, then the head of Longstreet's column needed to march over a distance of less than three miles to reach their destination opposite the peach orchard. And that's kind of why you might want to sort of fix the starting point. Okay, how far do these guys got to go? That puts the head of the column, you know, less than three miles. Now again, head of the column. You know, two divisions, the accompanying trains, ambulances, all the stuff are going to cover several miles of road space. McLaws' division in front, Hood's division somewhere behind them. So if the head of the column is three miles, you know, you're talking the tail of the column is probably at least double that. Five, six miles down the road from that. And also be reminded that for this attack to happen, the pieces all have to be in place. Right. So it's right. not the matter of the head of the column reaches. Right. Well, we're not attacking till everybody's here. We're not attacking till the trains are up. We're not attacking till the hospitals are established. There is a this is why it takes so long for this to right. happen. Right. And and I think that's where over time my view of the battle has shifted in some respects, in that I'm not fixating so much on these little details, but really the bigger picture and how it kind of connects into everybody. And yeah, I think one of the best things to do is just drive from point to point. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to get from the Chambersburg Road to the Black Horse Tavern in a car? Well, now, you know how long that'll take by a car, but then figure, okay, I've got to march yeah. numerous brigades. You know what, super march. fans? Don't do it in the car, super fans. Be walk authentic. It. Walk, walk it. it. Do yeah. it on foot. Do it on. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do it by car. But, I want to see know. the super fan counter march. Maybe we can make that happen. You know, we can do it. it I think that would be great. That the would first be pretty cool. Super fan counter march. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. All right, all right. Let's put that on the many things on our calendar. Yeah. So now, if you talk about a foot speed, you know, again, we, we know most accounts describe the country as rough, narrow farm lanes, fences things of that nature. Let's say you sort of settle on a rate of two miles an hour. If you got two miles an hour, your head of your column's got to go a, a little bit less than three miles. Then, you know, maybe you're talking 90 minutes to reach to reach your target. A little bit longer if they can't make that pace. So again, a 12.15 start time, 90 minutes, you know, if all goes well, could put the head of the column in position. Oh, what would that be? I'm doing the math in my head. About about 1.45 or so, maybe 2 o'clock, you know, kind of thing. And I'm just thinking to my head now, that would be a really cool project for somebody to take on where the earliest these brigades, depending on where they are, could get into position by this time. It's the earliest they could. If everything goes fine. I think we're just. If, do, I think we're doing we're that right, right now. Right, I'm saying we're do doing this that for, right now. Do this for don't, the entire don't battle. Don't, don't oh for the entire you know, battle. Sure. Because you know, okay, yeah. we just assume these people are just going to uh, show up. You know, but how long does it take a wagon to get here? How long does it take all this other yeah, stuff? Yeah. We don't think about that. No, and, but, and I don't. But want we're to thinking you. about that now. And this is where we have to say, it kind of expand your mind on some of these things because you have to have. It has to fit in a certain amount of time, ultimately. If exactly. actions fit into a little block. You have this bracket of 12-something to 4 o'clock-ish that you know it fits in. So how do we make that happen? How do we do this? And this is where, you know, going back to people say, well, I've walked the field all the time. Walking the field on your own is different than trying to do that in a line of battle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a big difference. So I don't want to say, well, it only took me you know, 10 minutes to get from point A to point B. That's different than when you're in the line of Well, how many super fans do we have right now? So if we have them basically, if we have the super fans marching in column, uh, you know, maybe we get super fans Tom and Colleen in the back with some wagons or something. I wonder how much road space we could take up if we actually go ahead with this experiment. You know, people talked about how many cars we had parked on Oak Hill and Oak Ridge for our Iverson we tour. Could, should we top that? 
Just wait for the heat we're going to draw when we basically clog up Black Horse Tavern for a day. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. I've got, I, actually, you know, I live in Cumberland Township. Should I start working on the permits now <laughs> for us to do this? Yeah, no kidding, right, uh, right. Have our legal team headed by Dan Sickles yeah. start looking into this to make sure that we're not... Uh, Maybe all those out-of-town historians who are carving up her, her Ridge with their luxury homes can give us parking for the day? I'm wondering. Or at least serve us drinks as we go by. Yeah, maybe. That would be nice. That would, that would be nice. That would be nice. All right, folks. So we're going to take a quick break here. Jim, tell all of our super fans about tonight's show sponsor. Yeah, thanks, Eric. This installment of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast has been brought to us once again by the good people at TR Historical. TR Historical is a family-owned small business from Easton, PA, offering a one-stop shop for people like us who love history. They aim to support the engagement and fan enthusiasm towards history in fresh fun ways. They have swag that includes Civil War items, medieval history, the American Revolution, arts and science, World War I, World War II, presidential history, and much, much more. Visit their website at trhistorical.com. Yes, folks, that's TR as in Teddy Roosevelt. Or you can email them at support at trhistorical.com. You can also follow them on Facebook. They offer free U.S. shipping. Worldwide shipping is available by request. And super fans of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast save 10% with this code at checkout. Super fan. So use the code SUPERFAN to get a 10% discount at checkout. Once again, folks, that's trhistorical.com. Look for Teddy Roosevelt and their logo. All right, so back to the show. So, my friends, needless to say, the countermarch doesn't go well, right? We, we kind of have this starting point. As we talked about earlier, concealment, surprise is essential. Concealment from a supposed signal station on Little Round Top, considered essential. Um, you know, as is the need for the troops to reach their destination quickly, and as we said before, avoiding allowing Meade's army additional time to concentrate. Because while Longstreet and his troops are kind of getting this together, you got the Union Army's Sixth Corps arriving on the battlefield. You know, you got any rem- or approaching the battlefield. You got the remainders of the Fifth Corps, the Third Corps coming in that morning, the Artillery Reserve. You know, any time you chew up is giving the Army of the Potomac more time to concentrate. And at a certain level, Robert E. Lee understands that just because these parts of the Army of the Potomac arrive, they're not going to be able to just rush right into battle. That's a given. But I think he understands, and this is where sometimes people, I have had people be kind of anti Longstreet and go, well, that was so stupid. Why don't you just keep moving? Just, uh, just keep the time from yeah. I think Longstreet would argue whatever time we lose in the name of keeping the element of surprise is more valuable than us getting there on time and launching an attack where they see well, it coming. Well, clearly, clearly the decisions that are made validate that. Yeah. Because you're right. When they get to the quote unquote troublesome hill, they're going to have options and they are always. For the most part, they are always going to choose concealment over speed. So, yeah, if you're wondering from the Confederate perspective which one is more important, their actions tell us which ones they consider more important. And look at, you know, the issues that the Confederates will see at Chancellorsville with Jackson moving into position. I would even say Longstreet at 2nd Manassas. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have to get into position first before we can make this attack, and there's a point where if we go too early, the attack is not going to be effective. Yeah. If we yeah. go too late, the attack is not going to be effective. you got to find that sweet spot right there. Well, you know, and again, I had a note to bring up Chancellorsville at some point, since you kind of just opened that door. Maybe we kicked the door in a little bit. You know, compare this to Jackson's flank march at Chancellorsville. Starts early in the morning. Doesn't start as early as they wanted it to. And basically, again, consumes the, the entire day. You know, you think, I always kind of think about some of the similarities and differences. You know, we brought up earlier the idea of cavalry and continuous monitoring. Obviously, you know, Jackson ultimately was aided at Chancellorsville by intelligence gathered, not only from Stewart's cavalry, but by friendly locals. You know, and he's got cavalry to help screen him through the wilderness. Longstreet has got none of that in Pennsylvania. Well, and I think also going back to Stewart, it's not just the intelligence, but at times, Stewart's troopers on May 2nd blocked Union access 
to where Jackson was moving. Yeah, well, I thought I just said yeah, screen, yeah, right? Yeah, right, screen. You know, right, I think that gets right. forgotten, too, is that, you know, what would you have done had you had Stewart's troopers out there? Okay, we get to the Troublesome Hill. You're probably going to have a trooper say, no, 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 right, no, no, right. don't go up here. Go, right, go right, here. Right, right. And so I think that's the, it alleviates a lot of problems. And I think this is where, and I think, unfortunately, you know, these two flank attacks, I don't know if people compare them consciously or not, these are probably the two most famous flank attacks in the history of the Army of Northern Virginia that they're going to be making here. And what we're going to see is that Jackson's supposedly great yeah. success on May 2nd right. overshadows Longstreet here. And I think it, everybody thinks that you know, Jackson's movement was this well-oiled machine. Yeah, not at all. Longstreet. Not at all. It's, there's problems on each of them, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say Jackson had, one, better terrain to be moving through. He also had better support to be moving through. The road network isn't as good. I would much rather have the road network we have here at Gettysburg than maybe what Jackson had at Chancellorsville. Yeah. It's just easier to yeah. to move. When you have all that out, out near the but, Catherine Furnace and all that stuff. Yeah, but I mean, I, I just think that we, over time, I think somehow, whether people do it on purpose or not, they compare these two attacks. Well, and the other thing, too, is, you know what you have that is common to both attacks? Dan Sickles. Woo. Today's edition of the Dan Sickles Report. So, again, think about it. At Chancellorsville, Jackson's March passes Sickles' front. Now, for as much as, you know, we enjoy Dan Sickles on the podcast, I will acknowledge that his interpretation of Jackson's march as a retreat at Chancellorsville, probably not Sickles' finest reconnaissance moment, but at Gettysburg, even though he can't specifically see Longstreet coming, he still reads all the tea leaves mm-hmm. to come to the impression that, okay, the Confederates are massing on my flank. And believe it or not, Dan Sickles then is a difference at both battles because he, he helps the Union Army be not prepared at Chancellorsville, and whether you like his means and his methods or not, he does, to his mind, increase his preparedness at Gettysburg, which hurts Longstreet, because when Longstreet comes out of those woods at Gettysburg, the element of surprise is long gone. Long gone. And we look at this, and this may be an unpopular opinion, Sickles might have been the only officer of any real rank on July 2nd in the in the Army of the Potomac that really has kind of figured out what Lee is maybe doing. He comes to it in a roundabout way. You don't see George Meade thinking, well, maybe they might attack to our yeah. left. You don't, you don't hear that a lot. And I think now a lot of what and we've talked about before, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for Sickles. But right. Sickles is really the only one that I think seeing this kind of gathering storm here and at least interpret it maybe as potential trouble. Yeah, I know. Now, super fan Fran will always say on his tour as well, even the blind squirrel can get the knot. And people giggle at that. Oh, Sickles, you know, kind of thing. But I think really you look at everything going on, the firefight in Pitzer's Woods, all of that stuff. And again, he's kind of reading the wrong stuff to come to the right conclusion Mm -hmm. because the Confederates are coming his way and troops are going to be there by the time Longstreet shows up. And that is also where had Stuart been present when that movement happens, they can then quickly say, hey, they have moved up. They are at, they are not where they were. Be aware of this. Which that's the monitoring piece. There's the. I think we yeah. we forget how all of this works together, and it is. I think we really the idea of at times people will say, well, to understand Gettysburg, you have to understand Chancellorsville. <laughs> I think at times we have to look at not so much understand Chancellorsville, but where what did Lee have at Chancellorsville that he doesn't have here? Mm-hmm. What that that matters because they're not the same battle, the yeah, same conditions, yeah, yeah. And, and everything. Yeah, else. you're not just replaying one or the other, you know, fantasy football kind of thing. Yeah, so I think all of that is right. You know, back to kind of then maybe Johnston is the recon officer. So when we last left the counter march, the the head of the column has passed basically. They they've started on her ridge. They have cut over to the right past the Adam Butt Farm to now access the Black Horse Tavern Road, which is then going to take them marching towards the um, towards the Black Horse Tavern. I don't have it in front of me, uh, but folks, if you're getting a little confused here and you want a map, we had a countermarch map in the Peach Orchard book, Gettysburg's Peach Orchard. Again, I don't have it with me. I forget what page it's on. Phil Laino in the Gettysburg Campaign Atlas also has a countermarch map. So either one of those two 
fine, fine publications you might want to pop open at this point to kind of refer to the route I'm talking about. And I might even recommend some period maps of Adams County just to kind of look at what the road network actually looked like at the time of the battle. And there's a number of reasons. If you're confused as to what that area looks like kind of west of Gettysburg, those are some good resources, I think, to give you a sense of what's going on. Well, since you brought it up, I mean, I do PowerPoint presentations on the countermarch. I do them for roundtables and groups and that sort of thing. And I often reference the county map, the COPE map, even the Batchelder isometric map. There's only a handful of roads in that vicinity that we're going to be using. There is a farm lane some sort of lane that basically ran from her Ridge Road to the Black Horse Tavern Road that went by the Adam Butt Farm. That, we think, is where Kershaw leads the head of the column. The Black Horse Tavern Road, which kind of runs along the creek and passes the Black Horse Tavern, is clearly there, clearly a significant road. Uh, and then at that point, the Black Horse Tavern Road is going to cut across the Fairfield Road and continue in the direction Towards the, uh, towards the Union flag. So we've talked about Kershaw being in the lead, but riding even further ahead is Captain Johnston, our recon officer, and Division Commander McClaws. Longstreet, you know, is going to say to the effect, well, because, you know, I was being guided by the commanding general's special engineering mm-hmm. officer, I was relieved from the march, and I rode at the head of the column. I'm sorry, I rode in the middle of the column with Hood. He says he rides in the middle of the column with Hood. Eh, not my favorite Long Street moment. I know the Long Street apologists out there are going to say, well, who cares? What difference does it make? It's going to matter. It's going to matter in a couple of minutes, in my opinion. Well, and I would think really the place for Longstreet would be at the front. That's where any information that's going to alter this is going to come from. So the quicker he knows it, the better, because there's going to be this lag of they discover it. Well, now we've got to go find Longstreet. And we're trying to go almost like a salmon swimming upstream. You've got to ride back through this massive humidity Uh to find him. Uh That is a challenge. and It's a time burner. You know, and... Yeah, and I think this is where maybe Longstreet feels that it's handled, but you know, I don't know. For As we always talk about Longstreet being so meticulous in his planning for these attacks, I have a hard time going with the idea of Longstreet being the meticulous planner and being willing to just leave this really important position. Mm-hmm. Just kind of, okay, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, well, I agree. I agree. And I, so I don't think it's uh, it's not my favorite Long Street moment. And again, if you folks want some context, the movie Gettysburg marching into position on July second, Long Street and Lee, they're marching together. They're talking. The music is playing. General, ride with me. Yeah. yeah. Is this, is this the speech where Lee says we can always expect the empty chair? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, I think you know, this heat reminds me of Mexico. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh, there were some good men down there. Yeah. And I was waiting. Actually, I don't know. Did, was it said in the movie? Down there, it was a dry heat. Or I, I don't know. If not, it should have been. It should have been. You know. I think that's in the extended director's okay. cut. So just to give you folks some context, none of this is covered in the movie. No. Although, Longstreet does say in some of his accounts that General Lee did ride with him for a while. So it's interesting to put, we don't know how far Lee gets. I know people have various theories on it. So it is kind of interesting to speculate, at least for a while, how long of this, you know, time or length Lee might have spent with Longstreet. But we don't know. And with that idea, if Longstreet is at the head of the column, he is further away from General Lee. I will just, actually, that came to me kind of in my head as you were saying that, that, okay, if you're going to want to give an excuse as to why he's maybe in the middle there, he's closer to Army headquarters. And really, as you said in the movie, it doesn't cover the countermarch. The closest we get is, you know, Longstreet does say, you know, I don't want to go out without, going without pickets, like going without a boot on. Right, right, right. That's the closest we really get to it even being mentioned. Yeah, right, right. Right, right. And, you know, and again, why is that important? Because the movie gives us the image of the perfect long street, the ideal long street, the long street that every Gettysburg enthusiast since the Killer Angels was published in 1975 you know, gives you the the ideal long street that generations have, you know, really kind of grown up on. Yeah, I just say, as two people that have, I don't want to say defend Danza, I guess we kind of do at times, but you know what? It's easy to defend James Longstreet. That's an easy client. 
Dan Sickles, not so much. You know, you know, I'm just saying, if you're making your career out of defending James Longstreet, you've at least got a, a headwind to you as you do this. You're not trying to be out in the middle of the sea and there's no wind. It is, the right, Dan time. It is the right time in history to be doing that. Uh, you know, as we often say on the JNO Buford report, right? Anybody can say Buford yeah. was a great cavalryman. Who is going to argue with yeah. you on that? It takes it takes real spirit to come on here to an international audience and put our necks on the line for Dan Sickles. Yes. Yeah. You know, it does. I think he has been affectionately referred to at times by some people as our boy, our boy Dan Sickles. Our boy, well, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, but we're giving them now an onslaught of Longstreet. This yeah, is we our are. Third, this is our so, third Longstreet installment. But I think, once again, this goes back to there are actions everybody makes here that can be defended, that cannot be defended. That That's the fun of history that yeah. we can debate that. Yeah. And, but I think what we're saying is that there seems to be at times almost this idea that there's it's almost conspiring against Longstreet. Yeah, that I you know, agree and with. and right. I don't right. I don't see that. Right. I think Longstreet's as much to blame for it, or these are issues that are out of anybody's control. Right. A hundred a hundred and thirty years ago were people conspiring against Longstreet? Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, you know, for the most part, yes, there are one or two major historians today. I'm not going to call people out and mention names because I don't do that. But, you know, yes, there are one or two historians out there today who are well known for being anti-Longstreet. But the vast mainstream, I agree with you. I don't think there's any vast. Cons- well, I know there's not. There is not a vast conspiracy to blame the Battle of Gettysburg on Longstreet. There isn't. Like you said, 130 years ago, Yes. On the afternoon of July 2nd, no. And there's also things that happen on a battlefield that no matter how well planned your attack is, everything goes right. There's things that are just, you know, the military today calls it that idea of friction. Yeah. Things that, that, yeah. that cause the plan not to work to the level you want it to. Yeah. That happens, and we have to appreciate that. And But the presence of friction does not mean the presence of a conspiracy. That's right. That's right. And our discussing friction as historians doesn't mean we're blaming him. No. We're blaming him. You know, that it doesn't mean anything like that. Longstreet would not be the first human being to have things fall apart throughout the course of a day when they're trying to get something done. Just usually we haven't had it at this grand of a stage. Right. Right. Okay, so let's move them along. So, so Longstreet's troops, you know, they move to the Black Horse Tavern Road. They pass by the historic Black Horse Tavern. Now, at this point, and again, this is why you want to kind of drive the countermarch, walk the countermarch kind of thing. At this point, if you're in the Confederate line of march, again, we're talking head of column, basically the Black Horse Tavern and her ridge are on your left. So they are blocking and concealing any movements towards the Union position. But that's going to change in a minute, because as the head crosses the Fairfield Road, McClaws and Johnston soon led Longstreet's column to an elevation, a hill, that rose up to a height of about 40 feet. And from this hill, McClaws observed Union signal flags, quote, in rapid motion, roughly about three miles away on Little Round Top. So McClaws halted the division. He rode with Johnson, quote, rapidly around the neighborhood to see if there was any road by which we could go into position without being seen, end quote. They weren't able to locate any immediate alternatives. McClaws rejoined his command and at this point met up with Longstreet, who had ventured forward to kind of ascertain what the cause of the delay was. And this is what we were kind of saying before. Okay, Longstreet's at the middle of the column. You know, there's some time to kind of locate him and bring him up. Had he been right at the head of the column when this happened, who knows, they might come to an alternative quicker. But he wasn't, and they don't. And the very least... Division commanders, battalion artillery commanders, staff officers, they do know their role. Mm -hmm. And at a certain level, they're not going to overstep that. Yeah, right. Where having the general in command of the operation there, you're going to get your verdict one way or the other. You're not going to have to go find the judge. And I think that's where, yeah, would it have made a difference? Who knows? I mean, the same thing could have happened if Longstreet's the head of the column. Right. That is a, a variant. I think there's sometimes this idea that, well, if only he had been there, it would have been totally different. We forget the fact that sometimes things can be different 
and the same thing happens. Could have the same outcome. You know, it, that's always a, a viable option. Uh-huh. Like, what if Jackson was at Gettysburg? Could be very different. Could be the same outcome. You know, who would have ever who would ever tackle that issue? I know, I know. You know, I got it from Super Fan Mary and Super Fan Chris just on a tour yesterday. They love the show. They didn't listen to that podcast because they don't like what if history. Yeah. Well. You know. <laughs> but there's still uh, still some of my among my many favorite super fans. All right, so we should get moving along here. It was a hot afternoon, as we've said. It's been a long day. The delay added to a growing sense of frustration. Longstreet inquired, "What's the matter?" McClaws responded that quote, "We can't go on this route without being seen by the enemy," and he took Longstreet to basically view what they call this troublesome hill. They get to the top of the hill, Longstreet surveys the terrain, and he goes, Why this won't do? Is there no way to avoid it? Captain Johnston, what do you think? Guess what? Captain Johnston's got no answers. Wah, wah, wah. So our reconnaissance officer is no help whatsoever. But McClaws had apparently reconnoitered some of the ground earlier that morning. Remember, he had been told not to, but he says he did anyways. And uh, informed Longstreet that the only way to do this was, quote, by going back by countermarching. Hence the title of tonight's episode, Longstreet's Countermarch. Longstreet agreed, although Kershaw noticed that Longstreet and McClaws were, quote, unquote, both manifesting considerable irritation. End quote. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> you know, everything's conspiring to make everybody upset. It's hot. Yeah, it's hot. They're hungry. They're tired. It's just long you know, day already. This is like this is like the worst family vacation to Gettysburg ever. You know, like the station wagon's broken down. We're having to walk. Uh-huh. You know, it's just it's miserable. You yeah, know, kind of like when you're doing the tour and the family shows up 45 minutes late and then they need to stop and get gas, you know, or, or they have car trouble. Yeah, it's, yep. it's like that stuff. Yeah, it happens. It happens. It happens. Longstreet in his report is uh, somewhat dip- diplomatic, but he says, quote, engineers sent out by the commanding general and myself guided us by a road which would have completely disclosed the move. Uh, end quote. And that's sort of how Longstreet describes it in his report. And once again, going back to Chancellorsville, we forget that initially Jackson comes into position and realizes, oh, wait, I'm not at the end yeah, of the right. line. I've got to adjust this. Right. Longstreet never gets that option. You know, he gets there and then, for lack of a better term, oh, crap. You know, so, yeah, we can see some differences here. And, and it's not just, you know, if you if you don't like Longstreet, you can blame him all day long. If yeah. you love Longstreet, you can absolve him. Right, him. right, right. Uh, you know, it's just it's a breakdown across the board. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Now, so again, back to the number one question. The number one question I get whenever talking about the counter march is question number one: Why didn't they follow Alexander's route? It's the number one question. And again, I think. I'm being you honest. His, you mean his horse droppings? Exactly. The yes. horse droppings, you know, the whole, the tracks, the artillery, the whole nine yards. Folks, and again, I apologize, but I think I get asked this question totally out of proportion to its importance because it really is not a significant part of the counter march, but it is sort of, again, part of the interesting, you know, we're trying to solve a puzzle today. Mm-hmm. It's not going to win or lose the Battle of Gettysburg, but it's a puzzle. It's a little mystery here. And, and part of the puzzle is, why didn't they follow Alexander? And and I always love that quote. I mean, it's hilarious. If they had only followed my horse droppings, they would have, you know, one, my first point is, who wants to walk through horse droppings? That's point number one. But number two, if you're Alexander, are you telling me there's nobody you could leave at that critical juncture to say, I've right been left on. here by, by, Alex, by Alexander? We have seen some things. I'm letting you know what's going on. Maybe. You know, I love well, that after the fact, Alexander just easily says, if they'd only listened to me, it would have been okay. But he never in the moment does anything to make sure they would have listened to him. Well, you know, like you said earlier, though, you know, we're dealing with the military mindset here, which could very often be do what you're ordered and not overstep it. So so we don't know. But you're right. It's um, There's a lot of court sort of questions here. Let's talk a little bit about what Alexander says. Remember, when last we saw him, it's taken him a couple of hours to put his artillery along a, a, a Willoughby run by the Pitzer's schoolhouse, which is 
pretty close to where Longstreet and McClaws need to end up. And after a while, he's waiting, wondering, where is the infantry? So he goes, I I then went about hunting up the other battalions which were attached to the infantry. While thus engaged, I came upon the head of an infantry column, which I think was Hood's division, standing halted in the road where it was in sight of Round Top. They had been instructed to avoid being seen. Finding the, the road on which they had been sent came at this point in full view of the signal station. They had halted in finding themselves already exposed and sent back to General Lee or Longstreet for orders. Okay, that's one of his descriptions of it, but you guys get the idea. He comes back, he finds the infantry in the road. Okay, the second part of that question I always get is... Why didn't they see Alexander's trail? And I want to be very clear. Nobody says they did not see Alexander's trail, right? Right? They find a reason to not use the trail, which is different. And Alexander writes, quote, For some reason which I cannot now recall, they would not turn back and follow the tracks of my guns. And I remember a long and tiresome waiting, and at length there came an order to turn back and take another road around by Black Horse Tavern. Now, again, there's a different version later where Alexander says something like there was nobody in authority around who could make the decision. But whether you like that version or you like the other one, they never said they did not see Alexander's trail. And maybe we can dispel another Gettysburg myth here on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. And also a general rule of thumb in 19th century warfare, and really warfare in general, you don't put all your forces in the same route. You know, that that's a challenge. You're basically funneling everything here. It's much easier to have multiple different routes to get to the point you're trying to get to. So conceivably, they go, well, okay, if we follow this route, is it good for infantry? Mm-hmm. Would it actually save us any time? Right. You know, I mean, those are right. things that just because... You know, you can use artillery to get through there. It does not mean you can march basically two divisions of infantry through there. That's a different animal. And so these are things that we don't often think about, but I think do factor in at the moment. That just because it's there, once again, it's another one of those moments. If only they had done that. Right, right, right. Well, right. yes or no. It just, you know, I just, I think we sometimes feel with this battle and going into the what ifs, you know, we forget that that sometimes just all the what ifs always seem to be positive. <laughs> you never assume that the what if could be, it could have been worse. Actually. Could have been worse. You know, and I think what we're seeing is if Jackson was a Gettysburg, could have been worse. It could have been. And we never know. But, but I think that's where with this, there's a lot of, of misinformation. I think there's a lot of confusion. It's an area that people don't really go to. Right. You know, and that's, and generally speaking, and this is not bashing the park service. If the Park Service doesn't control the property, they're not going to interpret it. That's just that's a general rule of thumb for historical entity anywhere. I don't control the property. I don't interpret it. So we don't really do that. Right. And, and I've, I, you know, and I take groups out there, and, I've, yeah. and because of that, because of that, I've gotten to know some of the, lo- the landowners mm-hmm. over the years and, and can use some of that ground. But you're right, and this goes back to what I said earlier. This whole area. Black Horse Tavern, Black Horse Tavern Road, Her Ridge Road. It's really a fascinating sort of complex of Confederate movements, headquarters, field hospitals. I just love it over there. And I've I've had a number of tours at times. We're doing a long street centric focus on July second, and it's funny. We'll we'll be on Seminary Ridge for a time, and I said, now if you keep in mind the route of the counter march, what's going to be going on? And he'll go, you know, and these are people that if you're doing. A, in-depth long street yeah, tour assume. this isn't your first rodeo right, right. it's amazing how many people that i would consider very knowledgeable good students of the battle that'll say you know i've never been out there yeah right right and i'm going what do you mean you haven't been out there yeah. you know so and so then it's always fun that part of the tour go well do you want to right do it and right. you know it's a lot easier when in the car with them but you take people out there and they're blown away by oh, it yeah. and so it's an area that if you've not been out there, we hope this episode will fire you up to spend some time walking and driving through there. Making the counter march great again. Could we be doing that? You know, we've made a lot of things popular again. You know, just wait. You know, I'm going to predict three weeks after this episode drops, things we're are saying see, now. We're, we're going to start, pu- we're gonna start percolating. A lot of social media posts. Yeah. People are going to be, look where I am you know, kind of thing. At a, at a certain that. level, I should be kind of angry when people rip off what we say and don't give us credit. But you know what? 
I'm just glad that we're driving the conversation on this battle. I think, I have to say, I'm not tooting our own horns here, but I like to think that we are pretty influential in how we've been shaping civil thoughts of this battle for the last, at least well over a year. And I, and believe me, we take a lot of pride in that, and we're glad that you're listening to what we say and are, are we're, taking it to heart. We're two guys who enjoy talking about what we're doing, and, you know, we're glad that the people are kind of into it. So, yeah, that's all That's all true. So, so just to clarify, then, the Alexander question, nobody says they don't see a rude, but if you want to go back and read the primary sources to find out why they didn't follow him, you are not going to find that answer. So, you know, between Longstreet, McClaws, Johnston, Kershaw, Alexander, no account says this is why we didn't follow him. So we don't know, folks. You know, it's it's probably going to be uh, a historical mystery forever. We don't know. And sometimes for students of the battle, they hate that. Oh, that's hard what to take. What do you mean you don't know the answer? What do you mean you can just speculate? Well... I don't know everything. Nobody does. Well, nobody needs to apologize for this. In this case, we got four or five accounts, and th- one of the guys literally says, for reasons I don't remember, they didn't follow me. And, you know, we got to just kind of accept that sometimes. And so I think what we do then is the best we can do is take the accounts we do have, take a consideration of the situation as it was at the time, and then try to put together the most plausible explanation, but with the caveat that this is just speculation. The best interpretation we can possibly have. Yeah, and right. so I think, yeah, there is that that times where we don't have the answers that somehow we have failed humanity. And <laughs> I'll tell you what, you do any research for any amount of time, you're going to realize there's always going to be unanswered questions. I know. That's just I part know. of the, and if you cannot live with that, uh, probably history is not the field yeah, to be in. <laughs> Go right. do something else. Yeah. You know, yeah, right. Or, you know, these micro topics, Gettysburg, Little Bighorn, you know, you're into Waterloo, I'm into Little Bighorn kind of stuff, where, you know, they're micro topics and people want to know every detail. Where did Custer stand at 4.05 p.m.? What was Napoleon? You know, and you just you just can't do it at that level. And the counter march is a great example of that. Yeah. And, and to the that's just what we do know is that ultimately it's going to cause a delay. Right. We right. know that. Right. We, we know the impact it's going right. to have. And there are even some that will argue that maybe this delay wasn't as critical as some have made it out to be. There well, is that school of thought as well. Well, and I we have thoughts on that when we come yeah. to the end of the segment here. Yeah, so I mean so I think there's a lot of ways we can interpret this. And I think what's kinda neat about the counter march is that there is that not having that information allows for a lot more free thinking at times if you're willing to do it. Well, that's one because of the, we just we can't rely yeah, on what's said. That's one of the things that makes it one of the Gettysburg enduring mysteries kind of thing, which is what kind of makes it kind of fun. Because really, if you knew where they marched, and you'd be like, oh, okay, that's really just it. It's not that exciting. Yeah, it's really not all that exciting. Okay, now so now we're going to countermarch. We're not following Alexander. McClaws has basically said he's got a route, but we have to countermarch. Now, folks, countermarch is not about face. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a, and I've never reenacted, but I know this. Um, it's not an about face. It's a very specific sort of, you know, the head kind of files off by the flank and then turns around and goes in the other direction and everybody follows them. And that's basically, you know, probably the best way I can verbally describe that. And even that order to countermarch, was that maybe the best order to give? Considering where this is, theoretically, if you've got the head of McClaws is here, this problem area, you've still got Hood, where and Hood, by some accounts, still hasn't even cleared the yeah, Blackfoot right, Tavern right. yet. Oh, he definitely to has To me, it, right. it would make more sense that we do is we pause McClaws. Hood, you're now making the turn. You're going to lead the attack. Well, but once again, think about McClaws. We talked about this all the way back with Jackson's at Gettysburg episode. McClaws is maybe one of those individuals that feels he was left out in the cold in the reorganization that took place. And yeah, you know, this whole plan has been for me to lead the attack to point of honor. And now you're taking that away from me. Mm-hmm. I don't want that. Right. Some questions of his performance at Salem Church just a few months before. This might be a chance for him to redeem himself. He doesn't want to lose that opportunity. And that's exactly what happens. That's exactly what happens. You know, Longstreet reportedly says to McClaws, 
look, let's let let's let Hood take the lead. We'll save some time here. And McClaws basically does that. He says, General, since I was given the lead, I would like to maintain it. And again, it's an interesting commentary on Longstreet that he says, OK, you know, we always you know, we always frame this Longstreet, the subordinate, you know, how he is interacting with his superior officer, Lee. To me, though, here's an interesting interaction with Longstreet at the top of this food chain interacting with his subordinate. You know, General McClaws, I think you should do this. No, General Longstreet, I want to do this instead. Okay. You know, to me, that to me, that's kind of just an interesting Longstreet moment. And possibly with Longstreet at that point in the day, is he thinking in his mind, is this the troublesome hill I really want to die on? All right, right, and, you know, at this right. point, whatever. And I think it would be interesting to see, and I, the only really way you could do it is to honestly get two divisions worth of people super and fans. wagons We're back and, super and try fans, to yeah. see, okay, what would have gone quicker? Had you just let Hood do this, what would the impact be? What would, and it, I'm not saying that had Hood led it, it would have been better. Right. Who knows? Right. You know, right. Um, but but I think it is there is that variant they do not take. Right. And it's going to, of course, jumble things up even more. Even the best executed counter march is going to be a challenge. Yeah. And, you know, so now you have Hood's guys waiting, waiting, waiting for McClaws' division to execute this counter march. You know, in Evander Law, as we know, one of Hood's brigade commanders um, describes the counter march as, quote, one of many vexatious delays. Which has got to be a great Confederate word. Oh yeah, vexatious. Not yeah. a word I've ever used. But you. So now you've got Hood's division kind of in behind waiting. So so the whole the whole column does not counter march. I think it's primarily McClaws turning around and Hood waiting for McClaws to turn around. And you don't need to turn Hood around. You just have right. to let McClaws clear that. Exactly. And then, then basically Hood follows. Yeah. And, and what I think Hood is going to do. So so what McClaws is going to do is. You know, again, based on what we think, Kershaw talks about we basically went back to where we started. So they go, they they countermarch, they turn around, they're going to go back up the Black Horse Tavern Road, that farm lane that they used at the Adam Butt Farm to get from Her Ridge to Black Horse Tavern. They're going to use that farm lane again to now go back. They're going to go back from Black Horse Tavern to Her Ridge Road, cross over Her Ridge, and now they're going to basically cut down from there to the Fairfield Road. And if any of y'all know the Gettysburg area, they're basically cutting down the little, I think it's Fairplay Avenue, yes, where yeah. you would have the Adam Butt Schoolhouse mm-hmm. kind of on your right to kind of regain the Fairfield Road. I do want to mention, though, at this point, we want to talk about the Union Army Signal Station, because the signal station at this point does see something. And at 1.30 p.m., the signal station on Little Round Top says, quote, a heavy column of enemy's infantry, about 10,000 strong, is moving from opposite our extreme left towards our right. So they do see it. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting, and you talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of misinterpreting or interpreting Mm -hmm. the correct implications, what do they see? They see the column going back, and they think it means they are moving towards the Union right. Because what they don't see is them then kind of coming back again and heading towards the left. No indication that anybody ever really acted on that intelligence, Mm -hmm. but imagine if they had passed that to headquarters and Meade had basically shifted his entire defense to the Union right, thinking this heavy column of infantry was moving in that direction. Again, it didn't happen. And as I said before, there's any number of ways you can interpret that, and I would say that would be a valid interpretation. And I think that's the the challenge. that They didn't really know what he was. They're just reporting what they see. Mm Mm-hmm. They're not reporting what it actually means. Right. And I think really it's not the job of those guys at the signal station to tell you what it means. It's their job to report to it. See, tell you what and then you f- and then that's why you pay basically commanding officers the big bucks to figure that out yeah. from there. It also I think what's interesting too, you said, you know, the time we know is around one thirty. That's kind of cool that it at least places a time right. Right. for us around this point. Now going back, yeah, we're not saying it's exactly one thirty, but right. But yeah, it at least gives us a window that we have to start placing these things in because we have to have at least a portion of this at this point by one thirty. Right. It has to happen. Right. So that gives us another little tool to kind of mm-hmm. fill in to where this is going to take place and trying to solve the mystery. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know what we said before. Again, we're playing armchair detective. That's what we're doing today. We're acknowledging that. Had everything gone well, 
145, the head of Kershaw's column might have been oper- moving and arriving opposite the objective. Instead, at 130, you're kind of just turning around and you're not all that far from where you started. And even whether we talk about 130, 145, heck, maybe let's get crazy and say 2 o'clock. Mm-hmm. If Kershaw is reaching that point at that time, who has not yet done what he has done? Yeah, well, we'll come to that. So I'm just making we'll that, come to just that. Making that. We're just foreshadowing. That. Yep, we're just for- think yep. there's something big coming down the pike, if you will. Yeah, we're, for- we're foreshadowing. So uh, also, too, in my memory, if my memory's right, I think it's about 2 o'clock. There is a second message from the signal station that basically says, I see some trains, some ambulances moving up near Dr. Hall's house. Dr. Hall basically had a residence, again, further up her ridge, close back in the direction towards the Chambersburg Pike, but it's kind of out near where uh, Old Mill Road is today. And so, again, the signal station also sees movements up by Dr. Hall's place, which I think is probably Hood's division, Mm -hmm. and, you know, some of the trains coming in there. So we actually have two sightings of this from the signal station, but again, you know, nothing, nothing ever really comes of this. If you're Meade, we've talked about this before, Meade is very fixated on the northern end of his line. You know, that, that Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill corridor, if you will. That's what he's worried about. And I think a lot of Meade's actions up to this point has shown that he's not really possibly considering an attack to the south as being what Lee's likely to do. Right. And and I think this is where, you know, I'm not going to fault Meade for not predicting what his opponent did. I mean, he's not the first general not to do that. But I think he certainly understands what the most endangered point of his line would be at that point. And that's what he's focused on. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you're getting this information. It's nice, but there was not enough of an urgency as the point where they would have said, you know, to Meade's headquarters, sir, we're seeing at least two divisions forming on a ridge in front of us. Right. That's danger. Now. Right. Right. Just moving is not danger. And if you're me, there's the worry that what if this is just a way to confuse us to shift forces there? Mm-hmm. That's an option. Yep. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely right. And so, so we're going to gain the Fairfield Road. Again, there's some, we don't know, do they continue down the Fairfield Road? Do they kind of just cut straight across country? Um, You can kind of interpret the accounts in some different ways. What they're trying to do, though, is now reach the Willoughby Run Road. And the accounts talk about, you know, we pass over some rough country, again, some narrow farm lanes, you know, that, that, that they could not even afford a company front. You know, we kind of had to break off to the sides kind of thing. So yeah. cur- clearly there's some rough patches going on here. Narrow farm lanes. Try, try driving down Willoughby's Run Road today, today if a right, tractor's right. coming down the road. Yeah, right. Like, it's not a big road today. It's tight with two regular-sized right. vehicles. Right, let alone moving 14,000 yeah, so, guys. Yeah, I think this is one where, you know, don't take their word for it. Go out there and see it for yourself. Mm-hmm. It's still not the easiest road to yeah. drive down today. Yeah, I totally agree. And and so, um, so you're probably now approaching 3 o'clock. We're approaching 3 o'clock. Again, Kershaw's still in the lead. Uh, he's going to eventually reach the Pitzer Schoolhouse, which is a prominent landmark, which shows up in a lot of the accounts of this. Pitzer Schoolhouse roughly sat at the intersection of where the road now kind of interconnects with the Millerstown Road, which is, again, the way Longstreet's guys are going to want to approach to reach their objective opposite the Peach Orchard. So I've done the math on this over the years. I think now the total march for Kershaw, and again, I'm using him as the head of the column, total march for Kershaw was about five and a quarter miles. And what I think the counter march added and all of the days delays added was about two and a half miles. So I think this added about two and a half miles of marching distance to the head of the column. Two and a half miles. So if you're doing two miles an hour, two and a half plus, you know, however time was spent at the Troublesome Hill, what are you looking at? You've lost another 90 minutes. Maybe you've lost two hours, but I'd say somewhere in the 90 minutes to two hour range is what I think this costs Long Street in terms of time. And I think some that we cannot discount, and I can't prove this 100%, but we mentioned it's a hot day. Mm-hmm. These guys have been waiting around. Yeah. What's something they're probably going to want? Water. Water. Yeah. 
what's all throughout that area, how many little creeks and things. Yeah. I think you've got guys falling out left and right, probably, also right. refilling their canteens. Because also the thing, if we're going to go into a fight, I probably want a full canteen if right. I do this. Right. Yeah. So right. I think that's that. How much does that impact those? You know, a couple guys here or there that cumulatively adds to it. Mm-hmm. And and I think what we see is that, frankly, any delay at this point is going to be problematic. Mm-hmm. I think there's just no way to work around that. Now, to what level is that problem? Is it a game-changing problem, or is it just an annoyance we have to deal with? Well, that's you can debate that. But needless to say, this has thrown off this even more. If we look at the entire picture, the rest of AP Hill's core, the rest of Richard Yule's core are waiting. You know, this thing is already going off the rails, and... We haven't even fired a shot yet. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. And, and you know, now if you want to kind of pinpoint it to stuff that's happening on the union side, which we talked about a couple minutes ago, remember, Meade starts to record the initial arrival of the 6th Corps at about 2 p.m. So that's when he says, you know, and again, they've had a long march, they're strung out, they're not going to be ready to go into combat. But I think what's important about the arrival of the 6th Corps is that Meade then immediately, at least according to Meade's reports, Meade, quote, immediately directed the 5th Corps to move over to our extreme left. So the arrival of the 6th Corps at 2 o'clock has given Meade flexibility to kind of start redirecting the 5th Corps from the right to the left. And think about the timing there. The signal station, 1.30. Yep. They cite this. It's not going to take very long. I mean, you can see, even today, if you stand at the signal station, you can see Meade's headquarters. Right. If you look really right. carefully, you can see it. And so we're really looking at probably by the time that message gets sent, disseminated, and discussed, probably words reaching Meade, sir, the Sixth Corps is arriving. Right. So if you're Meade, you probably breathe a little sigh of relief that, okay, I've already got people in that area. Right. That's probably not a worry to me as it would be, sir, there, we were seeing these reports and nobody is moving in. Right. That's the... There's the interesting thing, and also, once again, going back to this idea, Longstreet makes this attack at 145, you're just getting the 6th Corps here. Exactly. And they, that, they're too late. They're and, too late. And I, and I, and so I think that's potentially, you know, again, I hesitate to use the word significant, but I mm-hmm. think it's interesting to ponder. Mm-hmm. You know, the other thing, too, you want to think about, too, is, you know, at what point Buford had gotten withdrawn mm-hmm. as the cavalry screen on Sickles' front. So let's say, just for sake of argument, and it didn't happen, but sake of argument, Longstreet is ready to attack at noon. Let's just say 12 o'clock noon. Buford's got a cavalry screen out there to at least let the boys know that they're coming. Sickles and the Third Corps are massed in and around Cemetery Ridge. We're not going to quibble where exactly the Third Corps is at that time. But now if you come in sort of in, the, if Longstreet could come in at this 2 o'clock vicinity, think about it. Buford's gone. As we said, the Sixth Corps is just coming up, so they're not they're not there yet. The Fifth Corps is a little bit further away, and maybe you sort of have Sickles kind of on the move again. You know, some of the guys are starting to move forward, but they're not in position yet. I can't help but think, generally, it's Second Manassas all over again. And yes, I'm stealing that line from the movie Gettysburg. Well. There is this sort of window of contention right. that if they can get there, this thing might be a different attack. And really, what we look at that difference between getting onto the field at two o'clock, two fifteen, and not attacking until four o'clock. Really, it's not that major of a difference. Mm-hmm. But if you consider everything that has happened to right. that point, right? Yeah, you know, because by two forty-five, Sickles is already up there. Right. We've got this little window. But had it happened, can you imagine this weird, all of a sudden Longstreet attacks as Sickles is trying to move forward? Exactly. Oh my gosh. And he's, mo- is- and he's moving forward with no cavalry screen, mm-hmm. and Meade does not have any reserve moved over to the left again. I think, I, and I've said this for years, I've got a little chart where I've kind of broken all this out, which unfortunately the listeners can't see, but I'm telling you folks, it's spectacular. But, you know, I think the idea definitely being what we're saying here, I think there's an interesting window in this two o'clock-ish neighborhood, which, again, had everything gone according to plan, 
head of the column arrives at 2, you know, maybe you're ready to roll by 2.30, 2.45. Again, it didn't happen, but something to ponder. And just think of the dynamic of the Confederate artillery is in place on Seminary Ridge. Sickles begins to move his guns forward. Next thing you know, they get opened up oh, on. We've got the infantry strung out. They're probably going to be in column. They're not going to be right. in line of battle. Next thing you know, we've got these Confederates pouring into the area. You can see how this could quickly... Right. Fall apart. Imagine at headquarters, me going, my heavens, what's happening on my left flank? Because even the whole three o'clock Council of War hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. Remember, folks, it's at the three o'clock Council of War that Warren has gone up to Little Round Top, finds out Sickles is not where he's supposed to be. S- Warren rides to headquarters, Sickles rides to headquarters, Meade grabs Sickles and rides back, and they have sort of their little peach orchard conference. You know, again, I really think if Longstreet could have got into position pre-3 o'clock, might be a different battle. So, yeah. you know, of course, we don't know. but And I think this shows that, you know, there are some that will say the countermarch doesn't really matter. Exactly. I think it does exactly. matter because That's exactly the point. it's not the matter that he lost two or three hours. It's he lost that 30 minutes. Right. That's right. that. That's what that's matters. The window. That's the and, window. And you know, I think it would be very fun to kind of game that out sometime. About let's put this scenario on paper and see what's happening. I think it's a bad day for the Union Army if that happens. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. And maybe we're all speaking Confederate up here. Maybe. Maybe. And maybe you are already speaking Confederate, but well, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, folks. So so to to the point that was just made. You could sit here and listen to all this and go, ah, the countermarch doesn't matter. The Confederates still would have lost anyways. Of course, we'll never know, but maybe. All we're asking you to do, open your mind, explore a little bit, explore the possibilities, the alternatives. And I'm telling you, Cemetery Ridge at 2 o'clock looks a heck of a lot different than it does at 4 o'clock. It does. It absolutely does. It definitely does. So, So, folks, think about that. Now... Should we come back to Longstreet? Are we blaming Longstreet for any of that? What do you think, Eric? Do you see anything that requires, you know, sort of a uh, a slap on the wrist from this digital cord of ours? There is nothing that I would say is malicious by Longstreet, or he's not performing as, you know, someone would say he's almost like a petulant child. Right, right. I don't see that. Right. It happens. You know, and, and what we're looking at is we're not looking at, as we said before, it's really about 30 minute window that he loses ultimately that matters. A couple things go differently. He gets that. Yeah. And, yeah. and all things considered, he gets his guys into position relatively quick. All things, because they're everything he's dealing with. Right. Um, yeah. I, I don't really find blame for long. He's, it's a series of unfortunate events, but suffering unfortunate events does not necessarily mean it's your fault. It just happens. Right. And and that's where I kind of come to Especially down. in complicated maneuvers like yeah. this and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. It's not that I think you can blame Longstreet for anything here. Where, where I do think the Confederate high command and the Confederate mindset is at fault, coming back to this idea of monitoring. You know, Captain Johnston's original reconnaissance has always been portrayed as wrong. No, it wasn't wrong, but by, you know, it wasn't radically wrong, but by four o'clock in the afternoon, we can all agree it is badly stale and outdated. Yeah, it's outdated. And so, so, you know, when is, is, is the head of the column starts to approach Seminary Ridge and, you know, Longstreet says to McClaws, how are you going to go in? And McClaws says, that depends on what's in my front. And Longstreet says, nothing is in your front. You're entirely on the flank of the enemy. Again. At least according to McClaws, that's what happened. But, you know, if you want to ding the Confederates for something, it's assuming that at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that situation still exists. And I'm going to come out and say it. Had Jeb Stewart been on the battlefield on July 2nd, this isn't happening. Could have made a heck of a difference. I think yeah. I, I just I think there's so many things where really, I, it's not so much Longstreet, but I'm just thinking, had only Stewart been here, or... Had Lee decided to move some of these troopers he has Mm -hmm. into that area. But once again, Lee's thought process, they're not capable of screening a movement like this. They're not intelligence gatherers. They're partisan fighters. Right, right, right. You know, they're not the savvy cavaliers that Stuart took with him. So, you know, yeah, I think this is where 
if you're going to fault Longstreet for this, I think you're you're doing a disservice to Longstreet because mm-hmm. there's right. some things out of his control that I think he shouldn't be blamed for. Well, it's funny you say that because I actually had a bullet point in my notes. What was outside of Longstreet's control? Mm-hmm. And, you know, not only is the absence of Stewart obviously outside of Longstreet's control, but as I kind of alluded to earlier, all of Sickles' moves are outside mm-hmm. of Longstreet's control. Sickles reacts very differently to Jackson at Chancellorsville than he does to Longstreet at Gettysburg. And so this idea that, you know, whether Johnston's recon is good, bad, or indifferent, you know, by four o'clock, Sickles has made it all a moot point because he's moved into something completely different. And although I do think it's someone's responsibility to be keeping an eye on that, you can't fault Longstreet at the same time, though, for, you know, what the movements ultimately are. And Sickles did one heck of a wild card variable <laughs> there. I mean, even to the point where almost until McClaws gets onto Seminary Ridge, the Confederates are still thinking they're going to be at the end of the Union. Yeah. I mean, that's something that I think doesn't get lost. It's not that they have like an hour or so, like, hey, we're not there. Right. It's right. when they get up there, they go, oh, whoa. That's now exactly what? it. And yeah, that's I, nobody. I don't think if you would have asked officers on that battlefield, would you think this is something that might happen? If I would set the dynamic, this is what Sickles does. Do you really think Longstreet <laughs> would probably say, oh, yeah, I think that's a viable option? No. Yeah, probably. Um, you know, I think it, what Sickles does it shocks the ecosystem so much that everybody doesn't know what to do. Which is what Dan Sickles is good at. That's what he shocking does. the ecosystem. Dan He's perfect. Sick- at that. I have often described Dan Sickles as an equal opportunity disruptor yep. on July second. Yep. Yep. Uh, He's disrupting everything. Yep. Friction. Yeah. Friction. Yeah. Friction. And that's why we love him. That's why we love him. Now, a couple of, couple of kind of closing thoughts here on all of that. One, if you don't, because I know some folks don't like anything that comes out of McClaws' mouth. Mm-hmm. Well, again, Kershaw basically says the same thing. He's told, you know, extend along the crossroads and you'll be on the flank of the enemy. Manley, one of the battery commanders, says in his report, I was told we were going to be on the flank of the enemy and we were going to rake their line. So, folks, if you don't like McClaws, fine. But there are other accounts that are um, kind of consistent with this. And, And on that, if you have such a disdain for a historical figure 150 plus years after the fact that you're unwilling to consider anything they might have ever said as being valid, maybe it's not the historical figure with the problem. It's you. Oh, are we going to start re- recommending therapy for the listeners? Perhaps? Maybe. Historical maybe. therapy. Historical you know? therapy. We'll put you in historical safe okay. space and we'll get you back to where you need to be. So like... So, like, somebody who gnashes their teeth over Dan Sickles, for example, might be a candidate for this new... I would say, we're not saying you have to like him, but don't disregard everything they say. If any of our super fans out there are trained therapists, maybe somebody would like to volunteer to conduct history therapy for anybody in the audience who needs it? You know, is... I think we need to market this. I think it's another I, winner of an idea. There are a lot of people in the Civil War community that I think could benefit from Civil War therapy. Yeah, I think that line would pretty much go around the block here at oh, Eddie's yeah. Gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think you think trying to get help today is easy. Mm-hmm. Wait till we do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to have a six-month waiting yeah. period. But it would be a good walk-in business for Getty's Gear because, you know, people could buy their, their coffee and their cigars and their dog treats while they As they're waiting. waiting. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? You could bring your dog. It could be a historical therapy dog. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. You know, so, yeah, there's a lot of things you could do so, here. But You know, we have so many good ideas. We only have so many episodes to fill all of them out with. It's a shame, really. It's a crime to society that we can't do more. It really is. But you know, in all seriousness, though, I think we see this tendency where people let their personal emotions or feelings towards a figure alter what they're doing. I think in your case, if it's just a clause on his own, okay, we can take it or leave it. But mm-hmm. when it basically confirms what other people are saying, when multiple people in different positions are saying the same thing, yeah, I, I, yeah, I have I a hard that. time where you would say, well, I have to disregard that, right. but I'm okay with what Kershaw said. I'm okay with what Manley said. But I'm not okay well, with what But I'm not okay with yeah. what McClaw said. Well, they're saying the same thing. Yeah, you know, it's... Agree. But and, and you know one more thing too is um, although I'm lenient on the quality of Captain Johnston's reconnaissance, I'm sorry I am going to ding him 
for his role as the reconnoitering officer and his claim that he had no idea he was supposed to be leading Longstreet in a position. I am dinging Johnston for that. I don't, you know, I don't care if somebody says, well, you know, he was never reprimanded and he served with, I don't care. You know, you look at basically his role, which he acknowledges his physical position at the head of the column. You know, even the aforementioned McClaws said later, you know, that Johnston seems to have no idea about the movement of troops. I mean, so this idea that Johnston is like, geez, I, I had no idea that I was guiding him over the route. I'm sorry, is preposterous. Also, why the heck are you out there if you're not leading them? Well, that's what I mean. Like, what, what are you doing there? Yeah. Are you just hanging out with James Longstreet all day? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And, I mean, is McClaw's such charming company that you're just going to ride with him all day? And or talk just about, admire his yeah, beard the yeah, whole time? Georgia Peanuts? I mean, what are they talking about? Yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I think, I think. Johnson's sharp enough to know what his role is. I do too. And I think the best way to describe when people say he he escapes censure, he doesn't really get in trouble for it. I think so many things went wrong that day. <laughs> that he kind yeah, of like it, 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 there's so you, many things wrong that you escape. Uh, you know, it does it it yeah. it basically deflects the attention from you. Lee's already got Alfred Iverson to deal with. How oh, many guys yeah. are you gonna reprimand for the Battle of Gettysburg, right? Yeah, it's you know, you know, maybe after had had this been a different era after the war, Lee would have had a podcast where he airs all those grievances. All those grievances. The Battle of Gettysburg podcast, guest hosted by Robert E. Lee. Yeah. We could have had him on the show. We could have. And, yeah. But with that said, I think that's just because he doesn't get into trouble doesn't mean that his performance was not lacking exactly. in that area. Exactly. And there's a phrase in the Gettysburg world relating to Stuart and ultimately a really good book. You have plenty of blame to go yeah, around. Yeah, right. I think he'd say the same thing about the the counter. There's plenty right. of blame to go I around. I think that's right, and I think a lot of that too will even extend out into the execution of the second day attack, which we're going to do at another time. Hey, one last footnote here because it relates to another frequent character on our show, and that's Coddington. Coddington. And I just want to point out that you know some pundits and historians would disagree with our assessment because we have come down here today on the side that the countermarch you know did potentially impact how the attack unfolded. It certainly changed the Union dispositions. But as a counterpoint to that, Coddington basically proposed that Longstreet hit the Union left at quote unquote just the right time thanks to Sickles. So I don't often find myself disagreeing with Coddington, but I am disagreeing with Coddington on this one. Yeah, and I think this is one of these events where how often do we delve into the countermarch for, at this point, almost two hours? Nice. You two know, hours of countermarch content. Yeah, I mean, and you really break it down and look at what it means, and you can come away from this and say, you know what, I heard what you said, Eric and Jim, it's good stuff, but I still disagree, and that's okay. That's all right, but I think we have laid out a case to show the countermarch matters. It is impactful, but there's also ways that had some things gone slightly different, it would not have hindered the Confederates as much as it did. I think we have to take the assumption that everything of the countermarch is bad. You know, it's theoretically without the countermarch, Longstreet arrives on Seminary Ridge earlier, Buford's still there. Does it have the impact it does if Buford's not there? Right. You know, right, we could say right. in a there is a alternative universe somewhere where the countermarch helped James Longstreet win July second. Maybe or there's the somewhere in the universe. This alternative universe yeah. there is that. Yeah, yeah. Now again, folks, just to be clear, we can't, we, and we're not, we're not saying yes, the day would have gone differently had Longstreet not had the countermarch. We're not saying that. You know, we're just saying think of it differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, really now is a good point to kind of call this episode. Because eventually we're going to come back and look at James Longstreet as a, as a combat manager, right. if we will. Right. But we think, you know, right now we've done two hours just in the counter march. And we did, what, six hours in the previous two episodes of Longstreet. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of Longstreet content to deal with. And, and also, frankly, we want to come back to Longstreet down the road we sure do and you know folks every time eric and i go into the studio i tell my wife eh, you know if you want to have dinner on the table in 90 minutes i'll be (laughs) home this is going to be a short one and once again we've broken our own record for how long we would think two guys could just talk about the counter march yeah i i think we have proven it's physically possible at a minimum to talk two hours about the counter march or about anything related to gettysburg clearly right clearly right so 
All right, put a bow on the counter. March. Yep. So I think that's that. You're right. Let's you know take this thing home. Uh, but I think certainly give the listeners some, a lot of neat stuff to think about. Hopefully, hopefully, so, and hopefully they'll see us on the field for their own counter march. You know, I think now we. have I was gonna say we almost have to do it now. Yeah, because I want to see this thing happen. Actually, just in my own mind, yep. and it's happen. all private property. So you know, we just gotta make things happen with various landowners. So you're saying if it's private property, I can wear cargo pants? You sure can. Yeah. I'm in. All right. I'm in. All right. Perfect. So as we like to say, we're going to put a bow here on this episode. But before we close things out, Jim, I believe we have a special request from a very devoted super fan here in Gettysburg who wanted us to just talk a little bit about something very near and dear to his heart. We do, Eric, and thanks. A uh, friend of mine, super fan Art from Prince of Peace, also bears an uncanny resemblance to uh, a member of James Longstreet's staff, Major John Fairfax. It's such a uncanny resemblance that super fan Art actually does living history as Fairfax. Now, when Art found out that we were doing our special three-part Longstreet series, Art said to me one day, you know, he said, Jim, you guys better make sure you give Fairfax his due. And after we recorded the extensive three-part interviews, Eric, it occurred to me, we didn't give Fairfax his due. So we are doing a special John Fairfax report tonight in honor of Superfan Art to kind of come clean on this so we can, you know, we can go into season four with a clear conscience as far as Fairfax is concerned. And that's very important. I mean, we have the Dan Sickles report. We have the J.N.O. Buford report. Now we have the major Fairfax report. I mean, we're starting to get a lot of reports coming in here. Do you think, though, maybe as we're getting to season four, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel a little bit? You know, we started with Dan Sickles and now we're doing Fairfax. Art, I'm just kidding. I love you, man. Oh, I, I could see. <laughs> how dare you say a staff officer was anything like Dan Sickles? No, 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 no. So in honor of super fan art, should we get to this edition of Absolutely. the Fairfax Let's report? Let's get into the Fairfax report. Well, as Art would like to remind us, Fairfax was clearly the staff liaison between Longstreet and Hood's division. So when you talk about that whole exchange about, you know, you know, well, they could just roll rocks down on us. Art. Wasn't that in a movie once or something? Yeah. I've, I've never you know, seen it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but but. Clearly in Art's view, and Art should know, if anybody should know, that that was Fairfax who was the liaison there. Uh, he believes it is well documented in various publications for his role in the go to the right incident, as we shall call it. Art would also like to mention that he has a copy of a letter written to Fairfax post-war from an Alabamian who had been in Law's Brigade. And in the letter, the former soldier tells Fairfax that he recalls seeing him in the midst of the brigade just before it went forward. Finally, an unnamed Longstreet staff officer smelling of alcohol. Alcohol, Eric, can you believe that? I thought they were all just good Christian soldiers here. They're drinking? Uh, a bit drinking. What do they think this is, the 11th Corps? Perhaps. Was or been Carlisle <laughs> Rhodes Division? Very good. It could be another Iverson report that we got going here. Anyways, a uh, officer smelling of alcohol was documented to have been near the foot of Little Round Top during the fighting there. And although super fan art doesn't say it, I think the implication is strong that that too could have been Fairfax. Nevertheless, and we might have talked about this in the Peach Orchard episode. Uh, if we didn't, we should have. Uh, nevertheless, that night, we do know that um, Fremantle... Rep Fremantle. You're a Fremantle fan. I'm a big Fremantle fan. Our good friend, Arthur Fremantle. Yeah, well, Fremantle reported that Fairfax was in a foul humor as he was the one who was assigned to make a commendation for more than 1,000 or so of the Union prisoners that were captured in and around the Peach Orchard. Uh, so, you know, there you have it. There is our Fairfax report. Oh, Art does add a little bit of actually interesting human interest trivia. Fairfax's youngest child, his daughter, Mary Elizabeth, or as we call her in the Fairfax family, Lizzie, long after the war, married General Roman Ayers, son Charles who some of us may know was a career army officer and obviously affiliated with the 5th Corps at Gettysburg. That couple produced a son. You want to guess what the son's name was? John Fairfax. Very close. 
Fairfax Ayers. Wow. Graduate, that's fancy. Graduated from West Point and went on to serve in both world wars. So, for super fan art and all of the John Fairfax fans out there, this is our first and perhaps our only Fairfax report. Back to you, Eric. So, before we close things out, we do want to let you know, if you want to find us on social media, all that information is in the show notes that you can find on the podcast platform of your choice. Also, if you're looking for ways to help support the show, you can find that information in the show notes as well. Before we go out, though, always we want to say, if you can, if you have not, please write a review for us. That really helps get the word out about the show and certainly uh, helps us gain listeners. And I think, as we all agree, the, the idea is to get as much information out about the Battle of Gettysburg as possible to as many people as we can. And that's what we hope we can continue to do. And thankfully, with your support, we've been able to do that. We're all in this together, folks. And, uh, you know, I would just add to, again, you know, don't want to come off like we're obnoxiously selling swag. But if you are interested, of course, we do still have stuff at the Battle of Gettysburg com, which is our store. All proceeds, as always, go to support the show and keeping the show free so that eric we can bring james the hammer longstreet to the people of gettysburg for four more years at least and speaking of a place where longstreet once was and actually probably spent a good bit of time mm -hmm. during the battle uh, as of the recording this is actually march 1st here as, as we're here but just last weekend we had a wonderful event with our friends and partners over at the seminary ridge museum jim just tell some of the super fans. Many of them were with us, but those that maybe weren't able to to join us, tell them a little about what we did over the weekend. Great point, Eric. So we had what was for us the first annual Seminary Ridge first day at Gettysburg Seminar. Now, our friends at the Seminary Ridge Museum have an annual seminar every year, but this was the first time that we partnered with them and the whole team over there, Pete Meal. Cody Aish, and last but not least, Robbie Williams, with special support from superfan Jody of Savage, just really put a great event together. Jim, Eric, Stu Dempsey, uh, you know, our special 11th Corps colleague, Cody and Pete, we all spoke on first day topics. Live and virtual attendance was at about 150 people. Uh, really just a seamless event. Folks got an evening reception. You got to go into the cupola at night. Uh, hopefully everyone who's listening and did attend had a great time. And if you weren't able to come to the uh, 2022 event, we do plan on doing it with our new friends of the Seminary Ridge Museum in the future. Yeah, it was a great event. Great time with, some, I think, some great historians, some really good insight into the battle that I think maybe... A lot of people don't get it. I know I had a number of people come to me after and say, you know, you guys were talking about things we don't really think about. And, and that's what we try to do. We don't want to just kind of give you the same old knowledge that's just been floating around year after year. We try to kind of give you some different insight into the battle and hopefully help you learn more in the process. Yeah, I ended up doing uh, Union Command Challenges on July 1st. Eric did a statistical analysis of the 26th North Carolina. Stu Dempsey did Ames's Brigade. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the 11th Corps, Pete did medical care, which again fit in perfectly with our venue at the seminary. And then Cody did a very well-received talk on Signal Officer Aaron Jerome, who, of course, was affiliated with none other than the great John Buford. So all of those topics uh, really just I thought it was I thought it was just a really good variety. And we seem to have gotten good feedback on it. And for those of you that weren't able to make it, uh, Jim and I will both be posting our talks uh, for season four so you'll be able to at least hear those we'll give you some more insight into them as well so if you were there we're gonna add a little more information to it if you weren't there you're gonna hear it for the first time i think it'll be kind of neat to do that and bring some of this information out to, to as many of our super fans as we can and you know if you were there even if you're gonna hear it again you got to go into the cupola at night i mean folks that is the equivalent of riding space mountain if rick nature boy rick flair were here in season four he would say you might not be first, but you're going to be next. And, you know, speaking of flair and the number four, as we go into the fourth season, is our perhaps theme going to be Diamonds Are Forever? And so is Dan Sickles. Could be. Is it going to be the four horsemen of Gettysburg? Maybe it might be the enforcer, Jubal Early. 
who knows? Who knows what might happen season four? We've got some big names lined up, so stay tuned, folks. We've just given them an onslaught of Longstreet. I mean, there's a lot to think of. I mean, perhaps could we have showing up in the Battle of Gettysburg podcast arena? Could we see folks like, oh, I don't know, John Reynolds? Maybe a talk on the Iron Brigade, possibly? Perhaps none other than a bow tie wearing Kent Masterson Brown. Oh, or what about that lovable dandy of a war tourist, Arthur Fremantle? They could all be here in season four. But all you- of these folks and more. And you know what, Eric? This is probably, though, getting to the point in the show where a critic might say, stop listening to the last five minutes. So maybe we should just leave the audience wanting more as we move into season four and just kind of bid our adieus for tonight. I think you said it best. So with that, I'm Eric Lindblade. This is the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. He's Jim Hessler. And so long, everybody. Good night, old Pete.